thousands of bizarre images captured all over the world. Mysterious creatures that live between blinks of the eye. What are they? That's the tougher question. Some think they are visitors from another dimension. Are these things that appear to be phasing in and out. Some fear that they pose a significant threat. And it looked like a missile. History suggests there may be a link to a real animal. The most plausible proto-terrigrate would look quite like many of the pictures of Mars. Missile, photographic anomaly, or something from another world. A monster quest investigation may finally reveal the truth. It could open up a whole new door to aerodynamics. The high-speed video camera will be recording at 2,000 frames per second. Hey guys. Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers on Monster Quest. The camera, capturing everything from news to weddings, immortalizing the moment. But they are also recording something else a missile-like object or creature able to appear out of nowhere for just a fraction of a second before disappearing again. To researchers, they are simply called rods. Who knows what it is, but there was something there. These things travel at maybe 135, maybe 200 miles an hour. You can miss it with the naked eye. Rods are described as one to six feet long with a cylindrical body and either multiple sets of wings or with a thin membrane of wings wrapped around their entire length, propelling the creature forward so fast they are undetectable to the naked eye. Rods have been little more than a curiosity. That is, until October 20th, 2002. Is it a bird, a plane, or something else? People are asking now that a mysterious object has been caught on tape over Albany, New York. Brandon Mowry is a photojournalist from Albany, New York. He was shooting video for a local newscast when he found something he could not explain. I went out to the airport to shoot some weather video that day. Uh, it's a five second bump shot for the weather, a tease for the weather. Um, I was shooting planes taking off at the Albany International Airport at the end of a runway. Maori did not notice anything out of the ordinary at the airport at the time. His discovery came upon returning to the station. While I was editing the tape, I happened to just pause it on, you know, on, on a frame, and um, I looked up, and there was this object in the in the shot. What is this? A UFO? Is this? It looks strange, like a missile. You know, like what, what, all these things are going through my head. He found a long cylindrical winged object streaking past a passenger plane taking off from the airport. To Maori, it appeared to be large and very fast, appearing in only a few frames of video. It looks suspiciously like a missile over a commercial airport. Maori called in station reporter Dan Bazile to view the image. Still in the shadow of 9-11, Bazile felt he needed to notify airport security. Airport security, airport officials looked at it and they said, we have no idea what this is. I don't think we caught this on radar. They called the FBI. FBI came in, an agent came in, he confiscated, or I should say he just took the tape from Brandon and he took off. There may be good reason for the FBI's interest. It appears again in 2003 over Baghdad, moments after a giant explosion rocked the city. And in this video, a rod appears to fly past a Swedish tank at a test firing range. There are a surprising number of rods found in and around military operations or where aircraft are seen. Leading some to theorize, rods may be connected to secret military weapons. I believe it was something classified that the government doesn't want us to know about. It's flying up in the sky, they didn't want us to know about it, and they took that tape, they don't want us to know. So I'm thinking this was some sort of test. To this day, Brandon has stuck to his story, and the FBI considers the case open and would not comment on its findings. There's no doubt that this event was taken very seriously, okay, by the FBI and the military. 
was definitely a matter of national security as far as they were concerned. Jose Escamilla is a Rod's researcher and historian who has collected over 2,000 Rod images from all over the world. And according to Jose, Rod's have been around for a long time. I'm going to show you a photo that was taken in 1910 in France. Here it is, check it out. And this is the object here. 1910 during a race, and this object was here, and it's definitely cylindrical in shape. It seems to have undulations on it. Skeptics frequently tell Escamilla rods are just birds or bugs distorted by the camera, but he argues many rods are recorded in places where animals should not be flying about, like this video. Something's captured on the video. It appears to be cylindrical. It appears to be moving at high speed. Filmed in May 1999 and brought to the attention of meteorologist Gary England, this rod appears to fly through a tornado. It was recorded on a broadcast quality camera from a news helicopter, tracking a tornado as it swept through Oklahoma City. A large uh, tornado was coming up in the southwest toward Oklahoma City. It turned out to be uh, an F5 tornado. It turned out to be a tornado with the strongest winds ever recorded in history. The rod appears to emerge from a cloud that England estimates is 10 miles away from the news chopper. But does it really? When played in slow motion, it is difficult to tell whether the rod is going behind the cloud or is appearing and disappearing. You see what appears to be a, um, looks like a cylindrical tube, but it's a flash. It's a, uh, it's a flash that appears in the frame. Bang, move very quickly. It, it looks like it just appears out of a cloud. I looked at it and you kind of go, wow, you know, what is this? And I have to tell you right now, I still don't know what it is. Jose Escamilla has also seen the Oklahoma City videotape. Here's another one farther down, and this appears to be going into the funnel cloud itself. So this thing is going into a pretty fast clip, and it's huge. That's an amazing shot. What was it doing in a thunderstorm that turned out to be that produced the worst tornado in history? You know, it didn't make a lot of sense. The photographers that capture rods on tape claim they were not visible to the naked eye and were only discovered later by chance, deepening the mystery. Who knows what it is, but there was something there. The rod's ability to appear and disappear in the blink of an eye leads some to an interesting theory. They are something from another dimension. I have seen footage, all right, of these things that appear to be phasing in and out. What I mean by phasing is they are there, and part of the torso disappears, and then the other torso, the other part comes back in. Whether it's from another dimension, I can't even answer that one. I'm just telling you what I've seen. This theory is not without precedent. Author and scientist Carl Sagan once said, if a fourth dimensional creature existed, it could, in our three-dimensional universe, appear and dematerialize at will. Is it theoretically possible for beings to cross between dimensions? Well, theoretically, yes. Professor Thomas Banchoff is a mathematician at Brown University. Time is used very frequently by physicists to represent a fourth dimension, especially since the work of Einstein in relativity theory, where we want to study phenomena, and the phenomena are events. You have three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. The classic analogy to understand dimensions higher than our own goes back to Edwin Abbott Abbott in 1884. He wrote the book Flatland. Flatland is a two-dimensional world, like the surface of a still pond. And one of the key things in that two-dimensional world, in the story, is a visitation from a creature from a higher dimension. A higher dimension is spaceland, and you have a beach ball that's ready to come through Flatland. When it does, A square, the narrator of Flatland, just sees the intersection of the sphere with the plane. He sees a circle. He recognizes circles. He's familiar with those in his world. But a circle that appears mysteriously and then disappears is something that is very hard for him to explain. Time travel and multiple dimensions have long been the basis for great stories. In 1895, H.G. Wells wrote the science fiction thriller, The Time Machine, later made into two movies. 
But most rods seem to be flying, not just popping in like Wells' time machine. One way to verify whether rods are either military experiments or an undiscovered flying creature is to see whether an object similar in shape can actually fly. Monster Quest puts it to the test. I believe the object can fly. Dr. Wee Hu is an aerospace engineer at Iowa State University. Any ship can fly as long as you uh, give a lot of power. Monster Quest and Dr. Who have enlisted several engineering students to help with an experiment. If these things are real, it could open up a whole new door to aerodynamics. They will build two different models, one with soft, flexible wings to simulate the descriptions of rods propelled by thin membranes, the other more rigid, resembling the descriptions of missile-shaped rods. When we test these things, the best case scenario we're gonna find is good lift and drag numbers. That'll tell us whether or not this thing actually has capable of flight. Um, on the other side, the worst thing that can happen is we turn on the wind tunnel and the thing just splits apart. The flight worthiness and aerodynamic characteristics of each model will be determined using the wind tunnel at Iowa State University. The models we made were, again, basically a flat plate, but the ends of it were somewhat flexible so it could move a little bit in the airstream. And then we covered it with a latex sheet to simulate like a skin or just some kind of covering. The wind tunnel allows the students to measure drag and lift in a controlled environment. Electronic sensors provide exact numbers. But is their experiment relevant to this photo? Allegedly picturing a craft that is at home in the water as well as the atmosphere, leading some to think that rods are alien UFOs. It was taken off of Norway in July 1957. It's a rod, you know, coming out of the ocean. Some researchers believe that rods could be a UFO. Now a photograph has surfaced, which bears closer scrutiny. We found a photograph taken by a naval person. It was taken off of Norway in July 1957. It's a rod, you know, coming out of the ocean, taken with 35 millimeter film. It has the rod shape, but seems to be moving sideways, away from the water, unlike any other rod images. While rods are, by definition, unidentified flying objects, are they from another world? I don't think so. I mean, we have objects, rod-like objects flying in, but that doesn't necessarily mean that an alien, you know, made them. This optical physicist says the classic winged rod images and circumstances surrounding them are different than the typical alien UFO sightings. UFO subject, of course, has a long history, approaching 60 years now, and it's not just visual is not just film or videos of things moving uh, at high speed. Uh, the UFO phenomenon has numerous witness cases where they see some object that's standing still or they see very clearly an object that's moving slowly enough so there's no doubt that they can tell the shape. Regardless of whether rods are from Earth or someplace else, the question for the Iowa engineers is, can the unusual rod wing design provide sufficient lift for flight? In order for the flying rod to fly, uh, you must have lift and you must have enough force to overcome drag. And so the wind tunnel can tell us basically the, the characteristic, if it's lift and drag characteristics. While they know the shape, they do not know whether rods are rigid or soft-bodied, so they are building one of each and will test the flight characteristics of both structures. The first model to enter the wind tunnel is the flexible body. As the wind speed increases, the team makes adjustments in the presentation angle of the rod. The flexible rod model soon begins to shake, becoming unstable in the wind unable to provide consistent lift. The rigid rod model is next to be tested.
And as the wind speed increases, the model remains stable. As they adjust the flight angle, positive drag and lift numbers begin to appear. The performance of the rigid model surprises the students. We got the numbers back and one of the tests was pretty surprising. It's a little bit stiffer. It wasn't flapping around in the wind as much as other ones. And it actually showed a little bit of a lift number. While the rigid model did perform better than the flexible body, it is still not a good flying design. It's just gonna have a lot of drag and not a whole lot of lift. So it would take a huge propulsion system to get it moving through the air. From what we found, I can say that kind of shape is not very efficient for high speed flight. But if rods are from the fourth dimension, and we are only seeing a portion of them at any given time, we may not have the complete picture. This particular study, I think the most important area that we may have is that we may not have the complete vehicle. It is very, very possible that we're testing only a part of the vehicle. And therefore, if the test shows that this airplane or this rod does not fly, it may be that we're only testing, for example, just the tail part of an airplane, for example, and we don't have the whole picture. While pictures of rods are a relatively new phenomenon, history says humans saw something very similar centuries ago, and with the naked eye. A 1,000-year-old stone carving found in Argentina reveals an image that closely resembles a rod. The issue here is, how was man able to see a rod 1,000 years ago, long before the advent of cameras? Modernized people like ourselves, we live in a very technological society, we're essentially domesticated animals. Dr. Robert Curicini is a professor of biological anthropology with Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. He says over the years, some of man's senses have been diminished. We spend a lot of time looking at the printed page or at a TV screen. We don't focus the eye muscles. We don't dynamically exercise the eye muscles. But non-Western people definitely do, and they have, in fact, 2015 is the, the average visual acuity for a non-literate person, whereas we go with 2020 being perfect vision. An object in the sky would definitely be more, more visible to uh, somebody that uses their eyes, even a modern person that's non-literate, or probably ancient uh, pre-humans and humans probably could see further and more, more sharply than we can. This rod image may support Curicini's point. Shot at a zoo in Minnesota in 2005, this ape seems to notice the rod as it streaks past something the photographer says that he did not see. Early humans uh, not only would have been using their eyes more dynamically, but it would be more important to them. There'd be a fundamental issue in their survival. So probably their peripheral vision would have been used more and would have been sharper as well as the distant vision straight ahead. But there is an account where modern man reported seeing a rod. This story first appeared in 1891 in the Crawfordsville, Indiana newspaper. The story goes that two icemen were working outside in Crawfordsville at about 2 a.m. when a bizarre object sailed overhead. Whoa, Jim, what's that up in the sky? Look at it. See that light? I see it, but I don't know what it is. I never saw anything like it. Oh, no. The icemen described the object as a seemingly headless monster, about 20 feet long and 8 feet wide, with no head or tail and propelled by fin-like attachments. Easy, Penny. It was called the Sky Monster and was said to swim through the air, much like these rods shot near a cave in Mexico. We wanted to go there and be the first to base jump into the cave. <laughs> Basically, we would jump from the rim, free fall for four or five seconds, open our parachutes, and then land somewhere at the bottom. One, two, 
Mark Lickley is an extreme cameraman. In November of 1996, while base jumping at the Cave of the Swallows, located 20 miles from Aquisman, Mexico, he captured some of the most impressive rod images to date. Well, when we first went to the cave on the first few trips, we we did not see rods. We did not know what rods were. We were just down there doing our, our jumping and filming. When the video footage aired on television, we got a phone call from a Jose Escamilla who said, do you realize what you caught on your tape? And he goes, there's rods on your tape. Skeptics of the rods phenomenon said these strange images are likely birds or bugs. What makes this footage interesting is that all three are seen together and they don't look alike. This is a great example of rods. And it's a good example because one, it's got rods at different levels in the cave. It's got birds in the scene and it also has a jumper under parachute down at the bottom of the cave. What's good about this is it gives us a great idea of, of rods compared to the birds. Lickley says he never saw or heard the rods during his cave dive, though he was aware of the birds and bugs around him. I'm gonna go ahead and play some shots with rods in it. And you'll see many rods darting through the lens. And as you watch, you'll also notice that there are other things in the scene, which are just the common bugs. But here we had one here, here goes one there. In regular motion, you'll find that the rods appear through the shot fairly quickly. But if we watch it in slow motion, Again, watch through here. And we'll watch again, frame by frame. It's quickly going through. You're seeing the rod fly right through the frame. Again, we're shooting at 30 frames a second. So you're gonna get one still frame, two frames, three frames, four frames, five and it's through the frame. So what we're proving there is that this, this, this creature, whatever it may be, is flying at an extremely fast rate. Probably the reason why we can't see them with the human eye. Uh, there's a lot of people out there who just want to say these are bugs flying fast through the lens. I don't think that's what they are. Jose Escamilla agrees that these rods are likely not bugs. The rod is what I feel is an entity of some kind that exists among us. It is a cylindrical shaped object that seems to be alive. It has the behavior of a living organism. There may be supporting evidence that rods are in fact animals. Videotaped outside a cave in China in 2005, this rod features details never before seen and could be the key to unlocking the mystery. Uh, it doesn't look like the pictures of rods that I've seen. I think this is, a, this is actually a shot of, of an animal. Most images of rods quickly streak through the camera's field of view in just a fraction of a second. But not this rod. It has a distinct flight pattern. Viewed frame by frame, you can clearly see an object about 18 inches long fly past the six-foot man in the screen. Even as it changes directions, two sets of wings are clearly visible. It darts and weaves around the man, looking more like an animal in flight than a missile's trajectory. If rods really are just photographic aberrations, as some skeptics claim, there may be a way to reveal their true identity. MonsterQuest has asked high-speed camera expert Peter Schmitz to conduct a simple experiment. Film a hummingbird on a standard video camera while recording the same bird on a super high-speed camera. Schmitz works for motion engineering. His high-speed film work is used by scientists to see what is really happening during fast motion. The super fast shutter speed reveals detail in even the fastest moving objects, like this internal combustion engine. 
or this fluid dynamics test. The precise details revealed by the high-speed cameras have given science a better look at how materials act and react under stress and pressure. Ornithologist Carol Henderson and Berta Martha Ewell will be joining Schmitz for the experiment. They were asked to view the cave image to determine if this is the flight pattern of a bird. Well, I'm not sure what I'm looking for here. I've never heard of these things. I haven't either. It's never seen it, never heard it. Let's take a look. Okay, here it comes. There we go. Now, it looks like they're, if there are wings, they're very transparent. The rod's maneuverability and speed exhibited in the footage seems to point to one bird in particular. The only bird that I've seen that it could resemble would be a hummingbird. Hummingbirds can have up to 70 wing beats per second, making them fast and highly maneuverable. Could the speed of the wing beat also explain the blurred image? So we've got one camera that'll be recording at 30 frames per second, which is more of a conventional type camera. Mm -hmm. And then we've got a high-end, high-speed video camera. This camera will allow us to take probably today around 500 to 2,000 frames per second. The cameras will be trained on an iRig clock or counter so they can match the images of both cameras. We should be able to play the videos back and marry them together and be able to determine using the high-speed video camera, if we're picking up what looks to be a rod with the conventional camera, we should be able to slow it down enough and identify just what it is that's flying through that field of view. Peter is hoping a hummingbird will fly through for comparison. They have set up the cameras near an active feeding station, but before the experiment can begin, there is a problem. A uh, little thin on birds out here this morning. Is there anything exciting happening or changing the weather? Uh, it is a little quiet here. Um, a few hours ago, we had a hawk coming through the yard, either a cooper's hawk or a sharp shinned hawk, and they eat other birds. So things are laying a little bit low. With the birds gone, Yule and Henderson review the cave video again, but this time they discover some problems with their hummingbird theory. In a cave setting like this, and considering the, the white color of the, the, the creature being shown, uh, it just doesn't seem like that would be a logical place for a bird to be. It almost looked like there were two sets of wings, but you couldn't uh, really see a flapping at all. Not only is a cave an unlikely place for a hummingbird, Geographically, there is a problem. Hummingbirds are only found in North and South America. They're not found in Africa or Asia. So the setting of this particular film would exclude the hummingbird as a possibility. If not a bird, then what? Yeah, it looks to me more like insect flight than it would any kind of bird flight. But insect was the first thing that sort of popped into my mind, not bird. Could rods actually be an undiscovered bug? History says an evolutionary predecessor of flying insects looked very similar. The most plausible proto-pterygoat would look quite like many of the pictures of rods. Professor Robin Wooten of the University of Exeter in the United Kingdom is a leading expert on insect biomechanics, paleontology, and evolution. He says the first bugs probably looked like rods as demonstrated by this flyable model. The origin of insect flight was probably about 360 million years ago. The proto-pterygote is a name which is being given to a kind of hypothetical ancestor of the winged insects. So these things would be gliding, using the movable winglets to stabilize their fall. But there is a problem with the proto-pterygote theory. I think it's extremely unlikely that proto-pterygotes would survive for any length of time because these are transitional forms. They're not very good at flight. They would need to have very, be in very isolated, very strange conditions not to, be, uh, not to have become extinct. There is the argument, obviously, that there are intermediate forms in the mammals in particular, the flying squirrels, the flying phalanges, this kind of thing. And so in that sense, it's not inconceivable that uh, an intermediate stage, which wasn't very good at active flight, could nonetheless make use of gliding. So one can't rule it out in, uh, in, entirely. Bugs may actually make sense. There are dragonflies with multiple wings, and many can travel as fast as small birds. 
they are also highly maneuverable and could produce a similar flight pattern. Peter Schmitz is setting up another experiment using the side-by-side -side high speed and standard speed cameras in his backyard, where he regularly sees an assortment of bugs. But well, let's see if we can um, go out there, set up a light, try to attract some bugs. Let's give it a try. Floodlight should attract many different types of bugs into the camera's field of view. Peter Schmitz and field producer Doug Hycheck must align the cameras so they are seeing the exact same field of view. Once again, the key to the experiment is the digital clock placed in front of both the high-speed camera and the standard-speed camera. Any object passing through both fields of view can be matched with a split-second readout. Stand by for wood chips. Tossing wood chips in the field of view confirm the cameras are properly aligned. There's your wood chips flying by. At 250 frames a second, we're getting a little blur. Okay. Yeah, the wood chips streaked on mine. I got them. Now we just gotta wait for a rod to fly by. It will be a long night for Schmitz and his experiment. Rod researcher Jose Escamilla has heard the bird bug conclusion from Carol and Yule and has an issue with it. That is not an insect. It's not an insect. And it's not a bird. This thing passed right by his ear, you know? Why didn't he react? All right, if it was a moth or an insect or a mosquito, you'd have heard, you, you know, you react. I mean, you, you know, you hear something like that. This guy didn't even know anything passed by him. Why didn't he react? Reporter Dan Bazile agrees it is not a bird or bug. The rod recorded over Albany Airport was too large and fast to be any known bug or bird. It wasn't moving like an insect where you can see, well, they can move here, move there, and it was moving straight, supersonic speed. It looks like a missile. High speed seems to be a recurring theme and could explain why people are not able to see rods. But determining how fast they travel is difficult. In most videos, there is no known reference for gauging distance. But the China cave rod is the exception. Just how fast is this rod moving? According to Peter Schmitz, the only rod video that contains enough measurable points for calculating an estimated speed is the China cave rod. To determine speed, there must be a starting point, an ending point, and a lapse time. In the China cave video, the starting point is the cave opening. As the man steps through the opening, a light change is clearly seen. He takes 10 strides, or an estimated 30 feet, into the cave, the end point. The rod appears at approximately the same point at the cave entrance, determined by the same light change, marking the in point for both subjects. The rod is visible for 30 frames before it appears to rise over the man's shoulder approximately 30 feet into the cave. Shot at 30 frames per second, this means it took the rod approximately one second to travel the estimated 30 feet. That calculates to 30 feet per second, or 20.46 miles per hour, well within the range of many birds, bugs, and bats. But speed aside, how do you explain the unusual images? There are no known animals that have two sets of wings spaced apart in quite the way these rods do. Doctor Who believes the answer to the rod mystery is in the camera. If you use the internet camera, you will see that's actually one uh, full image was separated into uh, image. One we call the odd field, another is even field. Doctor Who is describing a process by which video is recorded. In film cameras, it is common knowledge that shutter speed affects the image. A slow shutter speed can create blurring or elongated images, as in this example. But when the shutter speed is increased, the blur is reduced or even eliminated. However, in video, the recording process is different. The moving picture is made up of a series of stills or frames. Within each frame, there are two fields, interlaced together to give the video a smooth motion. So in a camera that records at 30 frames per second, there are 60 fields per second. For the all 
field, you will see the string line. For even field, it's also the uh, string line. The dual fields in each frame of video can create elongation and duplication of objects moving at high speeds. Using this car as an example, not only is it elongated when the two fields are combined, but four wheels are visible instead of two. To demonstrate, Dr. Who has set up a simple experiment. Fire a paintball through the field of view of a video camera. If his theory is correct, we will see not a single ball passing by, but an image in each field, creating a doubled or elongated image of the ball. The experiment is not a complete success. The ball has clearly become a blurred elongated image in this frozen frame. But when the frame is split into two fields, it is seen in only one field. The most likely reason is because the paintball was moving too fast to be captured in both fields. But his theory is still valid. All images would be doubled. In other words, one pair of wings becomes two, and two pair of wings becomes four. But then, how do you explain this rod with an odd number of wings? Hold on, wait, 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 wait. I just saw something. Look at this. Three sets of wings. Yeah, that's different. Jose and his assistant have found a rod image that seems to contradict Dr. Who's doubling theory. What does it mean? It means that their theory about double image is not going to wash with this. Going back to Dr. Who's interlacing theory, a videotaped image can only have wings in multiples of two. Three sets of wings would seem to be impossible, as no known bird or flying mammal has such a characteristic. But what about an insect? No insect has three pairs of wings. The maximum number of pairs of wings in any insect, known or modern or fossil, is two pairs. Dr. Wooten has seen all the rod images featured in this show and was asked, are any of these rods insects? There's nothing specifically insect about any of the shots I've seen. The stroke planes of insects tend to be down and forward and then up and back, sometimes like that, but always in this sort of way. Never are they anything like that. The individual shots of these, uh, some of these um, images in the Cave of the Swallows show the opposite. They show the, uh, the wings apparently up there at the top of the stroke and down there at the bottom of the stroke. And that would not fit with any, in, any insect that I know of. I don't think these are performing powered flight at all. I don't think they fit in with any known way of propelling an object through air but they're not beating wings. They're not operating in the way that insects would. Because in my view, these are projectiles. They have to be projected by something. Peter Schmitz and the high-speed camera test may reveal the answer to this mystery. As a crew member shakes the bushes and lawn to get more bugs moving through the field of view, rods suddenly appear on the standard camera. They have been hiding in the foliage. Rods, strange cylindrical images recorded on film and videotape around the world. The FBI allegedly investigated this man's video of a missile-like rod over an Albany airport. This scientist says rods are just photographic aberrations created by the cameras themselves. This man says a creature that looks much like a rod did exist at one time. And this man says it is a real creature that may be able to make its way in and out of the fourth dimension. And this camera expert has caught a rod simultaneously on both a high speed and standard speed camera. As a crew member stirs the surrounding foliage, rods appear first as just a streak. But when moving closer to the camera and the light source, the image takes on a more rod-like form. The high-speed camera has been rolling as well, at 1,000 frames per second, compared to the 30 frames per second camera. The source is revealed, a moth. 
By having the split-second clock readout in both camera views, you can match the exact object in both cameras. We did capture a few images that were very telling. Uh, images that appeared to be rods, but when we looked at them more closely with the high-speed video, determined they were nothing more than a bug flying through our field of view. So are all rods bugs? Not necessarily. In this series of digital still photos shot by Anders Jalovic in Malmo, Sweden, a rod swoops down to the water. As he increases the shutter speed during successive exposures, the rod clearly is seen as a seagull, but when he decreases the shutter speed, it becomes a rod again. And remember the failed paintball test? In four consecutive fields of video, a piece of red debris from the paintball can be seen falling through the screen, creating a rod image. Because of the wide variety of locations and environments, sizes and flight patterns, the most plausible theory is that rods are many different fast-moving objects, all distorted by the camera itself. That could explain this image shot by NASA in 1994. The rod image is likely just space debris. And this video shot in 1995 of a rod clearly swimming underwater. A known fish could be responsible. It would also explain why rods might be seen in the tornado footage shot in Oklahoma. Likely debris propelled by the storm at high speeds. A lot of people like to think that uh, pictures don't lie or cameras don't lie, and, and that, that, that's not necessarily true. They, they, they do the best they can to tell the truth. Mike Bergeron is an engineer with Panasonic Broadcasting, a company that manufactures cameras. Any camera is capable of producing uh, what we call artifacts, and an artifact is just something that appears in the picture that wasn't actually there. Um, that wouldn't have been visible to someone standing there watching. But if rods are all known objects distorted by the camera, why are they not seen all the time? A camera can be fooled just as your eyes can be fooled. Um, different things might fool the camera that wouldn't fool your eyes if you were there. Um, and a, a camera, especially a modern digital camera, um, it makes assumptions about what it thinks pictures ought to do in a normal situation. Now, occasionally it guesses wrong and it creates things that aren't there. And what about the Mexican K video, where birds, bugs, and rods are all seen in the same field of view at the same time? The moving objects that are most likely to cause uh, a, a double image artifact or a motion blur artifact are the objects that are moving the fastest from the camera's point of view. The things that will appear to be moving the fastest from the camera's perspective are things right in front of it. So they don't have to be going that fast to be going very fast as far as the imager is concerned. If they're moving fast enough, they can get a motion blur where they are in many places at once in the course of one exposure. The reason rods are only found occasionally is because you need just the right mix of object speed, distance from the camera, shutter speed, and light. History says early bugs did look like rods, but likely were not good at flight. Now that we're coming to know more about the way in which insects do work in terms of aerodynamics and in terms of other aspects of, of their flight mechanisms, now at last uh, a proper knowledge of insects is beginning to feed into technology. And the engineering team says one rod model could fly, but the propulsion system would need to be quite powerful. If rod, the flying rod, is discovered to be indeed flyable, it will not be a surprise to science. And if some rods really are undiscovered creatures or objects, science could learn from their design. There may be even better ways of flying that remain to be discovered. In this experiment, MonsterQuest used sophisticated photographic equipment under controlled conditions to reveal the true identity of several rods, proving that they can be debris, birds, or bugs. But without additional data, it is impossible to know for sure what creature or object is behind each and every rod image, like the mysterious video shot by Brandon Mowry in Albany, New York. We know only that the camera recorded a distorted image of some kind of winged object over the airport that day.
However, until the FBI releases the results of their investigation, we may never know for sure. What we do know is that it created enough havoc, all right, to have the FBI interrogate the cameraman and for them to take the tape and try to just sweep it under the rug. Because we've never heard anything of what happened to that tape anymore. At this time, science does not support the probability that rods exist in the modern world. But the door is still open. To say that they don't exist, that's, that's incorrect. They're there. What are they? That's the tougher question. In science, it's very important that we're open-minded. Because we don't know everything. Sometimes truth may be stranger than fiction. An explosive allegation. Did Soviet scientists try to cross apes and humans to create an army of ape men? Stalin was willing to do things that other people would cringe from doing. Was such an abomination even possible? There's nothing you could do with an ape-human hybrid. They'd rip your arm off. In a region where real ape men may have existed. So it's possible that a relic ancient human species didn't really go extinct. She was uh, just a big wild woman. A strange find could turn science on its head. This is the DNA results from the quit tooth. It's a bizarre journey where ethical lines are blurred. I have been called Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein. Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers on Monster Quest. This athlete travels the world performing extreme acts of gymnastics. But he is famous for something else. I am Dani Ramos Gomez. I work in a circus because I'm an acrobat. For his entire 23 years, Danny has been an object of fear and scrutiny to the world outside the circus. So, here I am. All my life, I have been here. Danny exhibits a rare condition known as hypertrichosis, or excessive body hair. It doesn't make him any stronger, but something does. The truth is that I don't know why they think I'm so strong. Some say that I'm stronger than other people. There is a really heavy trampoline that they need four people to carry, but I can carry it, not with one arm, but on my shoulder. They think that I'm strong and they are scared. Though Danny's strength comes from practicing acrobatics, some whisper that he's some kind of ape-man hybrid. He is not. But they are not the first to believe that the link between human and ape is close enough for the species to cross. In December of 2005, a fairly innocuous open editorial article appeared in the New York Times by animal psychologist Clive Wynn, commenting on ape-human crossbreeding experiments conducted in Russia in the 1920s. I would say that one can speak of the 1920s as the golden age of Soviet science. Anything was possible. The story was quickly picked up by Russian and European papers, introducing even more explosive information. An article in the Scotsman newspaper stated that, in 1926, the Politburo in Moscow passed the request to the Academy of Science with the order to build a living war machine. A new, invincible human being, insensitive to pain, resistant and indifferent about the quality of food they eat. Monster Quest went to Russia to find out how much of the report was true. The results were surprising. It was a very interesting story indeed. Kirill Rosinov is a science historian with the Russian Academy of Sciences in Moscow. In 2002, he says that he uncovered documents revealing that in 1925, Stalin approved a $10,000 grant to a Russian scientist, equivalent to approximately $120,000 today. The Russian scientist named Ilya Ivanovich Ivanov undertook a very strange experiment. Actually, he went to Africa in order to carry out the artificial insemination of chimpanzee females with human sperm. 
Rosanoff wanted to know how far this experiment went and whether Stalin or anyone else in the Russian government knew what they were funding. It's possible that they did not, as similar grants to other scientists were common at the time. Although DNA research was in its infancy at the time, Ilya Ivanov recognized the biological similarities between humans and chimps. The blood proteins were very similar. Uh, if the blood cells are so similar, sperm cells and eggs should be very similar too. And that's why he and other scientists as well thought the experiments uh, could succeed. After the October Revolution in 1917, the Bolsheviks began to reinvent Russia as the powerful industrialized Soviet Union. It was a time of unprecedented change. The Bolsheviks thought of science as a powerful tool to modernize Russia and also to enlighten the Russian people. This was a window of historical possibility. According to Rosinov, the documents reveal it was the French who opened the door for Ivanov. The Pasteur Institute gave him access to their primate facility in Conakry, Guinea, Africa. And in 1926, Ivanov's experiments began. He artificially inseminated three chimpanzees over the course of a year. The efforts proved to be futile. On the one hand, he didn't, um, the, he didn't get the hybrids, the viable hybrids. On the other hand, he couldn't exclude the possibility of success because three inseminations, it was too little. Chances for success were rather low. After several attempts and no pregnancies, Ivanov's strategy took a drastic turn. He wanted to inseminate Soviet women with ape sperm. Long before Ivanov's efforts, there were ape man stories in Russia, most often called the Almasty, Abanu, or Almas. They were described as six to seven feet tall, walked on two feet, were covered in reddish hair, and wore no clothing. A physical description not unlike the American Bigfoot or Asian Yeti. But stories of the Almasty include several important differences. It is said to have a more human looking face and allegedly used fire and tools. Dana was a female Abnauyu. Abnauyu is a local name in uh, that place, in Abkhazia. It is between Georgia uh, and Russia. Igor Burstev is a Russian historian and an expert on the mysterious hair-covered woman named Zena. She lives in the 1860s till 1890. She's very interesting, wild, uh, uh, human-like uh, creature. Local hunters went looking for the strange soul who haunted their region. This recreation is true to Abenu descriptions, though, as we will see, Zena may have looked much more human. Soon, the hunters found what they were looking for. She was eventually sold to a local man of means named Genava. She was very big. They say that uh, she was about two meters uh, high. Uh, that means about uh, maybe seven uh, feet. And also she was very uh, strong. She preferred uh, raw meat. She refused of the uh, clothes. It, that is why she was always nude, though covered with her ha hair. Her uh, style of life was very wild, as animal, animal life. She was uh, just a big, wild woman. After being caged for several years, Zena grew docile and submitted to a near domesticated life. Although she never spoke more than a couple of words, she roamed about the village freely and even worked at Ganaba's mill. 
he tried uh, to use her uh, to carry big socks uh, with grain to the mill and with the wheat uh, out of the mill. Uh, some about 100 pounds. She was taking just very easily. And here is where the story takes another unlikely turn. Legend has it that Zena had several offspring with numerous different men from the village. Zena's first child died when she bathed it in the cold river. After that, the local village women raised her remaining four children who were seemingly human and of normal intelligence. One son named Quit was said to be very strong, ill-tempered, and quick to fight. Quit, along with Zena, was said to be buried in Ganaba's family plot in Abkhazia, while Zena's body was not found. Igor says he did locate Quit's remains. Igor has provided Monster Quest with what he claims is Quit's tooth. In 2006, DNA tests on the tooth concluded Quit's mother, Zena, was human, indicating the stories of her height and hairy appearance were likely much exaggerated. However, this expert suggests the results may have been tainted. It's possible that the DNA that was recovered uh, before was human contamination. Kurt Nelson is a microbiologist at the University of Minnesota. He plans to run new DNA tests on the tooth. I'm going to go into the tooth and try to recover DNA to analyze it, to see what the nature of uh, the DNA is, to see whether or not Quit was fully human. Nelson believes it is possible the original results were contaminated with human DNA due to improper sample collection and preparation. When you touch something, you just automatically contaminate it with DNA. And it's very difficult to get rid of this. The DNA persists very strongly. So I'm just going to decontaminate the surface of this tooth by brushing it first. About 10 minutes of this scrubbing. Now I'm just gonna rinse off the tooth with some distilled water. And then I'm gonna place it into a bleach solution for an overnight incubation to further destroy surface DNA. So if uh, Zena was an Almasty, we possibly could solve the mystery of the Almasty. For 30 years, we waited for such uh, analysis. Joseph Stalin's plan for an army of indomitable eight-man warriors would have been a terrifying prospect. Just 10 years after World War I, Russia's army was depleted, and Stalin was desperate for more soldiers and power. Stalin knew no limits. Stalin was willing to do things that other people would cringe from doing, would never consider doing. Well, Stalin was a part of a culture of secrecy. He bred secrets. He lived in terms of secrets and traded in terms of secrets. Very definitely, Stalin hid things. We believed that um, the real story of Soviet history had been hidden or lied about. We really needed to go to the archives that started to open up after the beginning of Gorbachev's reforms. In 2002, Rosinov combed the central state archives of the Moscow region for details of Ilya Ivanov's experiments. The documents revealed that when Ivanov's work in Guinea failed, he moved to the town of Sukumi in what is now Russian Georgia. It was here the strategy changed. He intended to do the experiments another way, to inseminate Soviet women with the sperm of, of, a, of an ape male. Because in that case, you don't need to have many animals. You, it's sufficient to have just one male as donor. By 1929, Ivanov acquired several more apes, and among them was the orangutan male named Tarzan, who was to serve as the semen donor. At the time, Ivanov had no way of knowing his first choice, the chimpanzees in Africa, were a more viable genetic match to humans than orangutans. But he did know all apes are superior to humans in strength. Clive Wynn is an animal psychologist at the University of Florida. 
So I read Kerry Rosinoff's paper some years back, and it's an amazing story, right? The Wynn says even if interbreeding between apes and humans was possible, the idea that they could be made into soldiers is preposterous. There's nothing you could do with an ape-human hybrid. They, as it is, chimpanzees or any of the other apes are much, much stronger than human beings are, but nobody would dream of putting them into armies because, well, how would you order them about? I mean, they're, they're, they'd rip your arm off. If Stalin really was looking at apes as the perfect breeding stock for a new soldier, he was correct about one thing. They share the same willingness and ability to make war. Chimpanzees, like humans, can organize with each other to uh, fight against your neighbors. The question is, if you did cross man and ape, what would the outcome really be? Ironically, the 1967 movie Planet of the Apes may actually make sense. Hybrids would likely have many different attributes. You can't predict that it would look halfway between a human and a chimp, or they would have the best features of each. That's right, you don't know. I mean, it might not have the strength of a chimpanzee and the intelligence of a human. It might have the intelligence of a chimpanzee and the strength of a human, so you'd have the worst of all possible worlds. I mean, they'd be a weird, they'd be a weird bunch. And if they had an ape's strength and man's intellect, the results could be far worse. I have always known about man. From the evidence, I believe his wisdom must walk hand in hand with his idiocy. His emotions must rule his brain. He must be a warlike creature who gives battle to everything around him, even himself. Some wildlife researchers believe that chimps do not fight to protect food sources, but rather for reasons of domination, much like humans. It's true that chimpanzees uh, are, are violent. Uh, they engage in, in, in warlike uh, behavior, uh, but that's true of humans. It is a cultural artifact of, of these particular species. Chimpanzees are thought to be between five to ten times stronger than the average human male. And according to this former handler, they are unpredictable. Chimps are the dangerous animals to war with. And they are the sweetest, you know, that's the worst part. They, they are so lovey-dovey that you just want to be with them. The problem is when they grow and when the chimps realize how strong they are. I have a friend who was attacked by the chimps on one occasion, that was like maybe 12, 15 years ago. They ripped his hands completely. So they got to take him to the special hospitals and make, make new hands because both of the chimps attacked him. When he was trying to cover himself, they bite his hands. Chimps often target the hands, face, and genitals likely intended to disable and intimidate rather than kill the opponent. Bill Fields is a great ape researcher who has also had some close calls. One in particular involved a chimp named Peace K, who actually saved Bill from a violent attack by another group of chimps. And they screamed at me, letting me know they were about to attack and coordinate their attack. Fields was apparently spending too much time and attention on one group of chimps, likely making another group jealous. And Peace K stepped in, uh, took my side. Fields and Peace K directly challenged the oncoming chimps, and the attackers broke off the assault. But why do chimps attack? Experts say that, as with humans, the reasons vary. If you force the baby because you're stronger, then when the baby grows up, the baby will force you to do what uh, it wants. And they defend their territory. And part of defending their territory is defending the resources. They fight because the males are concerned that if these other males get to the females, they will probably kill the offspring. The reality is, apes and people are much more alike than even scientists expected. Ivanov was right on at least one count. Chimpanzees are almost 99% genetically identical to man and would be the best animal to try to breed with humans. Experts believe that man evolved from the same evolutionary branch as chimpanzees. Gorillas and orangutans evolved along a different branch. 
making interbreeding between chimps and people the most likely. Ivanov obviously gave some thought to what the offspring would look like as he made these crude composite renderings, the human face morphing into the head of an ape. So with an ape donor, Ivanov's work continued amid a climate of change. There was a sense that the Russian military was backward. And it's in 1927 that Stalin decides that they have got to make a concerted effort to rebuild, dramatically expand and develop their military machine. So the idea of biological engineering and some sort of Superman, I mean, this in a way is the answer to a country that is suffering from one disaster after another. Perhaps Ivanov also knew of Zeno. She was, after all, alive during the early part of his career in the late 1800s. Ivanov would have been troubled with the same questions we have today. Was Anna just a hairy, wild woman, an ape-human hybrid made in the wild, or an unknown ape species that locals called the Almisty? New DNA tests could reveal the answer. Kurt Nelson at the University of Minnesota is intent on identifying the DNA from Zena's son, Quit. Now I'm going to score the tooth with a Dremel tool. Okay, I've got my three samples here. The first one is the drill powder from the Dremel tool. And these two are the smashed tooth divided up into two samples. And one of them, I've added the human cells that I have to act as a positive control. I should get DNA in that one if the chemistry works. I've designed some primers that amplify DNA that is different in humans and chimpanzees. So I think that if an Almisty is a real creature that has DNA that maybe is intermediate between chimpanzees and humans, that I could see that difference using these primers. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the mitochondrial DNA and determine whether or not the sequence is human. Mitochondrial DNA is inherited exclusively from the mother, so the mitochondrial DNA from Quit should be the same as that of Zena, his mother. In Mexico, Danny Ramos has little concern about his condition or where it came from. I don't know anything about this problem that I have. The only thing I know is that it was inherited from an uncle. Over the years, he has tried to satisfy curiosity seekers, as well as those who wanted to test his hair and blood to see if he actually was an ape man. But in his heart, Danny has always known the truth. I am different only because of the hair. Inside, I am a normal person. Whether I fall in love or don't fall in love, I have a heart. I have a heart. The only difference is my hair. Many people have asked why he does not just shave his face, but he refuses. He says, this is who I am. To silence those who still believe he is less than human, Monster Quest has DNA tested a sample of Danny's hair. He is 100% human. Danny's condition is not the result of hybridization. One view of hypertrichosis is that it's a type of atavism. Atavism means evolutionary throwback, and um, atavism is one of the pieces of evidence for evolution. There are humans that have tails that are clipped off at the hospital, but you know that, that's considered to be an atavistic trait because the ancestors of the apes had tails. While Danny's appearance can easily be explained, how do you explain other mystery ape sightings? I think there's no doubt that there are uh, undiscovered species in every corner of the planet. Long before Ivanov and Zena, another man was speculating on our evolutionary past. In 1859, Charles Darwin and others set the stage for scientific debate about human evolution and natural selection. He did a fantastic job of getting his arms around evolution. 
Philip Regal is a professor of evolution at the University of Minnesota. We know natural selection works, okay? We know genetic drift can play a role. We know sexual selection can uh, play a role. We know chromosomal rearrangements can play a role. Finding out how they all fit together, though, is controversial. While knowledge of man's evolutionary tree is still incomplete, experts say the Tumai fossil found in Chad in 2001 exhibits human-like skeletal features indicative of an upright posture. Tumai is considered a human ancestor and appeared after the split from chimpanzees about seven and a half million years ago. However, a recent study from the Broad Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts, now suggests that pre-human hominids and chimp species may have interbred for approximately another two million years before diverging again for good, approximately five and a half million years ago. If we had interbred with chimpanzees or gorillas, that wouldn't shock me. It would have been possible because the early ape and man species had not diverged as much as they have today. As evidence to support this theory, non-human primates do interbreed. There are um, baboons and macaques that have been interbred and hybrids in nature and in the laboratory, monkeys. Um, there are supposedly hybrids between chimpanzees and bonobos. Bonobos are the free love apes. They engage in sexual activity all the time. Sexual expression is just another form of communication. And it is not unheard of for apes to become attracted to humans. Like this dramatic scene played out in the 1933 movie, King Kong. But most researchers shy away from the interbreeding theory. Even in the field of cryptozoology, the study of cryptids or legendary animals, which include creatures like the Russian Almasti, Asian Yeti, and American Bigfoot, or Sasquatch. The most commonly held theory is that these creatures are unique species of ancient ape, not man, and have somehow been able to delay extinction by remaining undetected by their most likely enemy, humans. Gigantopithecus is cited as the most likely ancestor a massive ape, 11 to 15 feet tall, that lived alongside man only a few hundred thousand years ago. This giant lived throughout Asia, and some believe even made it to North America over early land bridges. Well, there's about 2,000 or so tribes throughout the United States, the continental United States, and of those, there's probably 1,800 that have traditional stories that describe an animal that is the hairy man. To many, the thought of a large undiscovered primate today is fiction. But according to this expert, it is more than likely. In a place like North America where a lot of research has been done and where the total diversity is less than in, say, the tropical rainforests or the deep sea ocean trenches, I think we're going to have less uh, species uh, discoveries, new species discoveries, than in these tropical regions. But I'm pretty convinced that we will continue to find new species. Dr. Russell Mittermeier is a primatologist and the president of Conservation International. According to Mittermeier, 38 species of monkeys have been discovered worldwide since 1980. So a large, undiscovered primate is a possibility. The whole business of the Yeti and the Sasquatch or Bigfoot is, it's very interesting. And I'm, I'm someone who uh, believes to some extent in the possible existence of these creatures. Another theory that's been put forward is that these creatures are people with hypertrichosis who have become social outcasts relegated to life in the woods. Phil Regal says that is unlikely. If it was an atavism, you'd expect one character. You wouldn't expect long legs, um, hairy body, prognathicism, not being able to speak, that sort of thing. That's an awful lot of characters for an atavism. It's, it's more like a distinct species. Mm -hmm. Off knew interbreeding between similar animals was possible. Early in his career, he bred several hybrids that did not exist in the wild. 
From the antelope cow to a mouse rat and guinea pig rabbit, this image is of the animal he called the Z-Doc, a zebra donkey cross. A viable ape-man cross wasn't a big leap for Ivanov's way of thinking. So when the chimps failed to become pregnant, he arranged for the artificial insemination of women volunteers with the sperm of Tarzan, the orangutan male. But it is interesting that there are so many scientists who supported the experiments even, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the experiments on the insemination of women. The motivation of women who would decide voluntarily to take part in the experiments should be scientific in a sense. They should uh, feel, understand that they help science. It was difficult to find such women, but in 1928, a volunteer came to him. She was a woman from Leningrad, cited only as G. Dear Professor, with my private life in ruins, I don't see any sense in my further existence. But when I think that I could do a service for science, I feel enough courage to contact you. I beg you, don't refuse me. I ask you to accept me for the experiment. The question of whether chimps and humans could still interbreed today is complex and controversial. While we are very similar genetically, the different number of chromosomes in chimps and humans presents problems. If a human ape hybrid were to be produced, uh, I think it would be severely malformed and profoundly retarded. I think he would just get a huge mess. So I would expect this offspring to either not live very long or not even make it to birth. There are cases where similar animals with a different number of chromosomes have been able to produce offspring, like the mule, a cross male donkey and a female horse, or a liger, the offspring of a male lion and a female tiger. But there are problems with these new hybrids. It's like shuffling a deck of cards. Sometimes you're going to get a winning hand, sometimes you're going to get a losing hand. Probably most often you're going to get a losing hand. Even if an ape and human were able to have a child, they might not have a grandchild for the same reason that mules cannot reproduce. Hypothetically, even if we could produce some sort of human-ape uh, hybrid offspring, it would be infertile. So it would be impossible to start to create a race of them by breeding them with each other. But Regal disagrees, in theory. There are a lot of misconceptions about hybridization, and one is that uh, hybrids are always going to be inviable, like mules. Mules become the paradigm for hybrids. But that's just a rare example. There are hybrids all over the place, and they're not necessarily inviable. There's no law of hybridization. And the differences between man and chimps may be smaller than we think. Many of the same emotions, that they feel, we feel. Many of the, the, the same thoughts we have, in some ways, they have. Kanzai and Panbanisha are bonobos, a great ape and cousin of the chimpanzee. They live at the Great Ape Trust of Iowa, a primate research center in Des Moines. This new great ape was first discovered in the wild in Africa in 1928 living in an area surrounded by chimpanzees and gorillas. Bonobos are considered to be among the most intelligent apes in the world, and in many ways, the most similar to humans. Melon? Melon. Thank you. Compared to chimpanzees, bonobos have a more human-like face and walk upright more often. They also seem to be more willing and able to communicate with us. The mental abilities that we often look at are language, planning, problem solving, learning, social coordination. The apes have been in captivity since infancy. They have been taught to communicate in English through a touch screen of unique symbols representing over 350 words. And matata. Matata. Very good. Part of their abilities is that they have human abilities, and they have those human abilities because they have grown up in uh, a world that has been populated by humans, and, and their cultural exposure is informed by humanness. And like other chimpanzees, they are emotional beings. 
whether they're frustrated, whether they're happy, whether they're excited, because they have some of the same facial muscles that we have, and as a result, show the same facial expressions that we do. In, in some ways, they're more human-like than we really realize. The apes acquire language just as human children acquire language. They acquire it by growing up in a world that uses language. Cheese. Shit. Melon. Melon. Apes learn exactly the same way as humans do. But they also show we have much more to learn. We think we are the most intelligent, and that may be the case. I'm just saying that that is a very human-oriented view of what intelligence is. If I, if I went to the Congo, my ability to do calculus or, or my ability to play the piano or, or whatever it is I can do that people think is a, is a smart thing that I do would be meaningless there. Get the grapes out of the backpack if you like. Go ahead. I don't care. Go ahead. It's okay with me if you get the grapes. They're good grapes. Ivanov is not alone in exploiting the similarities between primates and humans. Medical research has long used primates to further our knowledge of medicine. These experiments are considered justifiable by some and examples of animal cruelty by others. Now, I have been called Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein. Dr. Robert White is a world-renowned neurosurgeon. In an effort to find relief for human quadriplegics living inside decaying bodies, he proposed finding a way to transplant a human head onto a brain-dead human body. Dr. White began preliminary experiments on primates in 1970. Viewers are warned that the following footage is graphic. It shows Dr. White's surgery, removing the head of one monkey and putting it on the body of another. Critics might say White's procedure was cruel. White says it was critical in advancing surgical techniques for the brain and spinal cord injuries. He says he could not have done this without his work with monkeys. As we're looking at the same cells, the same fibers, the same arrangements, the same chemical reactions take place in the tissues. The biophysical activity, which comes out the other end is electrical, uh, the way the cells communicate. Uh, so in other words, we've got the same wiring, Dr. White wanted to verify if he could transplant consciousness. We figured the only way we could do it was develop an operation so we could transplant the brain inside the skull, still surrounded by the head. The experiment was a success in that the monkey was able to think and act upon its thoughts, proving to White that its consciousness also moved to the new host body. He head containing the brain, now connected to the body of another animal, suddenly awakened, became very pugnacious, and in a sense, as far as its mouth and teeth were concerned, very dangerous. And from where our observations of the animal were taking place, he could see, taste, smell, and I want to tell you, bite. Ethical issues halted Dr. White's experiments in any capacity for good. In fact, nature most likely prevents any future possibility of transplanting the head of a human onto the body of an ape. The immunological problem here, tissue rejection, would be formidable. How is head transplantation any different than genetic engineering? other than what we are creating in the labs cannot look back at us or bite just yet. It is important to know that Ivanov was neither an atheist nor a religious man. He was indifferent. So the metaphysical question is, would he perceive the hybrids as animals or as human beings?
He thought of himself as a serious as scientist, and he thought it would be unscientific to speculate about that at this early stage. So Ivanov moved forward to inseminate woman G with orangutan sperm. At the same time, devastating forces in Russia conspired against him. In 2006, Newspapers around the world ran stories of Joseph Stalin's alleged effort to create an ape-man soldier. This man says he has the documents to prove interbreeding efforts were made. This man says an ape woman named Zena lived in Russia 20 years earlier. This man is doing DNA testing of Zena's son, Quit. Ilya Ivanov's attempts to inseminate chimps with human sperm were unsuccessful. Then in 1929, before he could inseminate a Russian woman with orangutan sperm, his plan was derailed when the donor orangutan, Tarzan, died. And for Ivanov, the historic window of opportunity was closing, and Ivanov's experiments were never completed. True to his capricious and opportunistic nature, Stalin by this time had eliminated all of the old school Bolsheviks, including many prominent scientists. He was on his path of destruction. And what of Ivanov? And Ivanov was arrested and put, to, uh, put into jail. They were now considered old specialists and were vulnerable to repression and political criticism. One year later, in 1932, Ivanov died of a stroke. His personal quest was over. One of the most sensational aspects of the story in the Scotsman newspaper was that Stalin wanted Ivanov to engineer an eight-man soldier. But did he? It seems that what began as a scientific article turned into a science fiction thriller. I wrote up a little piece about it for the New York Times, and it got published, and then, and I was watching to see, you know, is anybody gonna pick up this story? Is the, does the world find this as exciting as I do? And then about 10 days later, there's this even wackier story comes out of a British newspaper, The Scotsman, that this, is, that this was to do with Stalin wanting to breed a race of super warriors. And what I think must have happened is that my little story in the New York Times got picked up and elaborated and embellished by some Russian newspapers. And then the Scotsman's reporter in Moscow came across those stories and, and, uh, and repeated them. What were Ivanov's real intentions then? Ivanov's records reveal that the intended reason for the experiments was not to create a super warrior after all, but rather to discredit the church by supporting evolution over religious beliefs. Ivanov expected that his experiments would be a huge step towards establishing the exact human genealogy and should be used in anti-religious propaganda against the religious prejudice. The Russian church enjoyed huge influence in Russian political life, and Ivanov and his eventual patrons were afraid of persecution from the powerful church. And what of Joseph Stalin's involvement? I think that Stalin had really nothing to do with the experiments. There is no evidence to support the claim. The only direct connection to Stalin was a scientific grant awarded to Ivanov something Stalin had done with many other scientists of the time. In fact, later documents seem to support that Stalin held strong views against interbreeding. In 1936, an American geneticist, Hermann Moller, came to the Soviet Union and proposed to Stalin uh, uh, a radical eugenic plan. He suggested that the Soviet Union starts the program of the artificial insemination of women with the sperm of outstanding men. Stalin was furious. He vehemently opposed this plan. Why then was Stalin rumored to be involved, and how did the stories of Stalin's ape man come to be? People are always interested in dictators, so it would make this story more, sound more interesting. And what of Mother Nature? Could she be creating ape men that walk among us? Could Zena be evidence of nature's handiwork? Biologist Kurt Nelson has the DNA results. Okay, here we have it. The samples are divided into three sets. 
This is the positive control. This is purified human DNA in each case. We had a good strong band so that the purification worked. But what you see is that there's no bands in either the drill powder or the smashed tooth sample in each of the three primer cases. So that means that I just failed to get DNA. Uh, it's certainly a tooth. There was DNA there at one time. It means that the question of what the, what kind of a creature this was is still up in the air. While history says apes and man likely interbred millions of years ago, science says it is likely not happening today. At least there is no evidence to prove ape-man hybrids currently exist in nature or in the lab. But science continues to push forward to a time when Planet of the Apes could become a reality. Perhaps instead of looking for some hybrid creature out there now, perhaps we are the hybrid creature. The quest for an ape-man hybrid, or simply a better, stronger man, is an age-old pursuit that is tightly knitted into our history, science, and legend. The astounding possibilities of modern science shed a new light on Ivanov and his visionary work. We will find the answers to our ancestry someday, not because we want to make a hybrid, but because as humans, we are curious. In the remote jungles of Southeast Asia, frightened locals claim to see a prehistoric throwback. They come out of the edge of the forest into plantations. Said to be half man, half ape, locals called Orang Pendek, or Little Man of the Woods. This is an animal which is on the brink of extinction in this area. Fossil evidence says a unique human species did live here thousands of years ago. But has it survived? I think probably there are small relic populations surviving. Monster Quest launches an intrepid search up the slopes of an ancient volcano. This is a movement detector here. And finds evidence. Ah, I see the shape, yeah. Fantastic, well done. That may lead science to uncover the mystery. Well, this is interesting. There clearly are some toes. Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers on Monster Quest. The Republic of Indonesia, a country made up of more than 17,500 separate islands in Southeast Asia, a diverse and dangerous place of active volcanoes, dense rainforests, tigers, poisonous snakes, and rhinos. But there may be something else hiding here, a creature that locals have reported for centuries and scientists are only now examining. Said to be half man, half ape, mostly referred to as Orang Pendek, which in Indonesian means short person. I turned to the guide and said, you know, what is this? And, and his hand was shaking like this. He said, I don't, I don't know. Hair covered its entire body as I could see it. It was a very pretty color. Um, sort of tawny gold color. The last time when we were here, we saw it turn over a log, yeah? And, and eat the bugs underneath it. Described as about three feet tall, reddish in color, with a slender orangutan-like body, the orang pendek is always seen walking on two feet with an erect posture, and most disturbing, it has a human-looking face, a description that fits a real being. In 2004, scientists revealed that they had found partial skeletons of a very small species of human that grew no larger than a three-year-old child of average height. Named Homo floresiensis, or Flores Man, after the Indonesian island where it was found, it became known as the real hobbit, after the tiny creatures from the movie Lord of the Rings. Flores Man may have been small, but he was also formidable. Stone tools and fossilized remains of elephants and Komodo dragons were also found at the dig site, suggesting Flores was a skilled hunter. While these fossils are believed to be about 18,000 years old, experts believe that the Flores man likely lived alongside humans until about 13,000 years ago, before dying out. The question is, is there a link between Flores man, the real hobbit, and recent sightings of the Orang Pendek? The possibility certainly exists and, and, and should be considered that Orang Pendek and Homo floresiensis are one in the same. Jeff Meldrum is a paleoanthropologist at Idaho State University. 
Homo floresiensis may lie at the root of the stories of the small people of the forest, the orang pendek. Maybe this is a, a different species altogether. But where is the evidence? This monster quest expedition travels to the island of Sumatra, only 1,400 miles from Flores, where the Homo floresiensis fossils were discovered, and where locals claim to still see the orang pendek. Two veteran orang pendek researchers will lead a search into a remote jungle. It is here that they will deploy an array of high-tech camera systems, pheromone chips, and professional trackers. Go down the bank, yeah, for footprints, yeah. However, everybody here is aware of the story. There's nothing else that could be mistaken for. That's why, that's why it's so interesting. That's why I keep coming back. A decade before the Flores man skeleton was found, another researcher was investigating the Orang Pendek. I knew the National Park rather well. I'd been here since 1994. Debbie Martyr, a former journalist, was one of the first to examine the mystery. It started off looking, uh, trying to validate an animal that was here, an animal called Orang Pendek. In 1994, in the Karinchi National Park in Sumatra, Debbie Martyr claims she spotted the Orang Pendek. I saw a bipedal primate, which was moving very bipedally. Martyr, who was carrying a camera, never got a photograph. Once the animal had gone and once I'd stopped swearing quite dreadfully because I hadn't taken a photograph, bang went the front cover of Time magazine. She never got a good look at the creature's face, but from what she did see, it was not like any animal she had seen. Martyr claims it looked a little like an orangutan, but different. Very, very broad shoulders. So that the small, the head was very small in relation to the, the breadth of the shoulder. Orangutans do live in Sumatra, and skeptics say it is most likely the animal eyewitnesses are really seeing. But Martyr disagrees. It was like seeing something from the wrong side of time. The word orangutan is derived from the Malay and Indonesian words meaning man of the forest. Adults stand between four and five and a half feet tall and have reddish hair. But there is a problem with the orangutan theory. Officially, orangutans have never been spotted in this part of Sumatra. New researchers have continued the hunt. Jeremy Holden is a professional wildlife photographer who has caught images of rare animals like the Sumatran tiger and Asian elephant. I photographed many, many species that have never been photographed before. Many, many things, probably something like 60 or 70 species now, including birds. Holden has teamed up with experienced tracker Adam Davies in this Monster Quest expedition. If ever you were sort of having a fantasy island moment and you wanted a monster to hide, I always thought this would just be the place. The team is deep within the epicenter of the sightings in the remote Karinchi Seblot National Park. This park is where Debbie Martyr saw the Orang Pendek and where locals continue to see the creature. Located two degrees south of the equator in the heart of the island of Sumatra, Karinchi Park covers almost 1.4 million hectares over four provinces and is located within the Bukit Barisan mountain range, one of the most remote rainforests in the world. The search destination is near Mount Karinchi, the tallest peak on the island, rising to more than 12,000 feet above the Indian Ocean. It is also where in 2001, Adam Davies found what he believes is the footprint of the Orang Pendek. If you were to put that print next to all known species here, you, you would clearly see that there's a massive difference. The cast of the print reveals a strange anatomy, an opposable thumb similar to an orangutan, but with short, broad toes like a human. Davies sent a copy of the print cast to Dr. Jeff Meldrum for examination. These uh, pads are impressively stout suggesting that maybe this is a, a different species altogether that has adaptations to walking on the ground. Davies also sent the cast to Dr. David Chivers, a university reader in primate biology and conservation at Selwyn College at the University of Cambridge, England. So these footprints were very exciting, very unusual, uh, because they were uh, mixed characters from all the different apes and humans. 
To Chivers, the most fascinating detail about the Orang Pendek is its ability to walk upright or bipedally. There is only one other primate in the world that walks like this, humans. They've got the toes that are shorter, more like human. The heel is like nothing in that it's curved. We call it banana foot, khaki pisang. The print Davies cast in 2001 seems to support the Orang Pendek descriptions. The short, broad toes would be better for walking bipedally rather than grasping limbs like the mostly tree-bound orangutan. However, skeptics say the print could be from a deformed or mutilated orangutan. Meldrum and Chivers say Davies must obtain corroborating evidence, like similar prints, photographs, or a body. This 10-day monster quest search reaches the shadow of the active volcano Mount Karinchi on the dormant slopes of Mount Gunung Tujur. It's a beautiful place, but I would not live here because there's earthquakes, two slap bang in the middle of two volcanoes. It'll all be gone in an instant, and I love it, but oh, give me the heebie-jeebies. With 10 porters and hundreds of pounds of equipment, it is a physically demanding hike up the slick and unstable muddy slope. 7,000 feet above sea level to the rim of the volcano. Going up the trail is a bit deceptive because you see light through the trees. You always feel like you're nearly over the lip. But I have to remind myself I'm actually only halfway up. The team knows that one misstep could compromise the expedition. We're at the top of the volcano's edge and we're going to descend now down the lip of the volcano actually to the lake. This is the bit that I've been waiting for because the views are just awesome. You won't have seen anything like it. It takes my breath away. I've been here four times and there's not a, there's not a week goes by when in my mind I don't think about how beautiful this place is. Located inside the volcano is the Gunung Tujur Lake. They must traverse the lake to the base camp, set up near many game trails, where there have been numerous Orang Pendek sightings. One of the guides for the expedition has seen the creature. Holden translates his story. Yes, yeah, so what he's saying, it, was, it wasn't much taller than a metre, but again, he's talking about this big, big body. It was covered in, in um, greyish, yellowish hair. It was walking on two legs, not four. When they saw it, it did this, put its arms up. Which is a, like a classic ape defense to make itself look much, much bigger. And I've heard this story many, many times from many, many people. And when it was walking there, again on two legs, but it was reaching for branches as it was, as it was traveling. The guide also found a prince. Then he's saying that the, the jempol, the thumb, is actually far back. Jaudi Blakan, so he's saying it's, it's far back on the on the heel. It's not like with a human or a bear, where the, 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 the thumb is, is just part of the foot. This description is encouraging, as it seems to validate Davy's 2001 print. But there is more. He's saying, yeah, when we saw it, we were very, very surprised. Fear of the creature is a common theme among locals. They say this ape man is intelligent, able to remain undetected, while watching them from the dark jungle. Davies and Holden are now just an hour away from their final destination. But first, they must traverse the deep lake the only way possible, in primitive dugout canoes called sampans. This is where we were camped with Debbie, this uh, head, headland here. When, we saw, when she saw the first storm pending. The men and their equipment weigh the sampans deep into the water for their final push into what the guides say is the land of the Orang Pendek. Southeast Asia may have a monster. The Orang Pendek is said to be a race of mystery apes that lurk deep in the jungle. More than 30 years before the discovery of a strange skull, a similar creature was seen by unlikely visitors, American GIs. I flew the Hueys, and we had the uh, UH-1H models. Larry Wilson is a retired Army helicopter pilot. In July of 1970, Wilson was sent to Vietnam, assigned to the Air Cavalry. Mm -hmm. 
It was during a mission to replace a faulty communications device that Wilson saw something that even today he still can't explain. I would say November to December of 70, probably. It was kind of crazy. It was early in the morning. We took off real early because we knew we had to go out quite a ways. We uh, were flying down a stream valley, kind of like, and uh, the stream made a U around this ridge line that came down and it kind of pushed the stream out of the way. And rather than follow the stream around, we just hopped up over this ridge line. And as we were climbing up to get over this ridge line, ahead of us we could see this scraggly old tree. It must have been one that had been defoliated. You know, it looked like it was dead. And we saw the thing wiggling at first, and then we saw what it was that was wiggling. It was this like ape-like creature, but it looked like a man. We thought at first it was a bad guy. We almost killed it. Wilson believes he startled the creature, but it didn't move and continued to shake the tree that it was in as Wilson moved the Huey in for a closer look. His face was kind of round, you know. He didn't have what I would call a human skull. Uh, it was more flat on top and, and, and almost like a, a soccer ball kind of shaped to the head, uh, but short hair. There was no tail. I mean, his facial features looked very much like a man. Stories like Wilson's are common throughout the area, but the epicenter of the most recent sightings is the island of Sumatra in Indonesia. Jeremy Holden and Adam Davies are now just an hour's canoe ride from where locals claim to have seen the Orang Pendek. It just always occurs to me when I travel in these that this is probably the first ever type of transport that was made by human beings, just a hollowed log, because that's what these are, nothing more than a hollowed log. With the last obstacle behind them, the team set up their expedition base camp. Now the hunt begins. We finally arrived at base camp. Um, we've spent days traveling here, we've climbed that mountain, we were covered in sweat, and now finally we're here. One of the good things about being here is that a couple of days ago, the guides built um, our shelter. Now we're gonna be spending most of the time here. Um, obviously, when we're resting, we're gonna be eating and sleeping here and also cooking here, all the lovely dried fish we bought and all the other things. What I know about the Orang Pendek is from people who've done a lot of detailed research here, like Jeremy. Um, it's, it's obviously bipedal. Um, it varies in size and colour. It's an opportunist feeder. Um, and it seems extremely intelligent. It's, um, it's a unique um, and obviously a very rare species. As the search is about to begin, the rainforest lives up to its name. It rains nonstop for almost two full days. The expedition is halted. Most animals hunker down in storms, so a search now would be futile anyway. If the storm doesn't break soon, the entire trip will be in jeopardy. This rain, I've never ever seen anything like it. I've been up to Gurun Karinshi. This is my fourth time here, and it's absolutely chucking it down. The rain is awesome. Place is beautiful, but it's just so frustrating. Finally, a break in the clouds. The expedition is back in action. The principal aim of, of Project Orion Pendek was to validate the claims we made about our sightings. Either some DNA evidence, hairs, bones, some kind of skin matter, or in my case, a good, clear photograph. And that's the one thing that up until now, neither myself nor anyone else has managed to, to photograph. Hey, Donnie. But getting a photograph of Orang Pendek will not be easy. The one problem with Orang Pendek is it, it seems to be highly mobile. So it's not living in a territory 
or not, certainly not living in a very small territory. And also it's not following a set route. There's always going to be die-hard skeptics. That are, they're not going, to, not going to be convinced unless you dump a body on their desk. Turn the camera on. While the heavy rains have washed all the game trails clean of old tracks, it also provides the team with a unique opportunity. Just like the research team, the animals of the forest are on the move, and the signs are fresh. There's our first sign of wild animals here. You can see wild pigs have been turning up this ground here, looking for roots or reptiles or insects to eat. So I came in here to have a look if there was any sign. Doesn't seem to be any sign of our own pen neck, but what we have got is a mound of tapir dung. It's not just animal tracks that give hold in hope. This area also has good food sources. So to my mind, for OP, this is an absolute classic location. Nice and open, plenty of things to eat. One of the things we found it's quite commonly eating are these, these gingers. And what it does is break, usually quite high like this, and then again quite low and then twist this stem. So what we're after is this white pith inside. It's not bad. More freshly minted animal tracks are a good sign. The animals of the forest are on the move again. We've chosen a spot here for the camera. There's a small trail coming up. There's a, what I call a topographic channeling is happening here. It's likely any animals coming down from the mountain here, wanting to cross over into this valley, are going to use this. It's not particularly pleasant to walk through this forest here, and it's, it's, it's very steep, this side. Rain clouds can be seen in the distance. Time is running out. Because our appendix are biped, it's still going to be taller than most animals we'd usually photo trap. So we have to have the camera far enough back so we don't end up with a picture of a chest with no head. While Holden works on setting up the traps, Adam Davies gathers his gear to head in another direction. The two have decided to split up to cover as much ground as possible. Now behind camp two is an area of the greatest concentration of those sightings where I found a number of trails in different years. If we do find something, I have um, scalpels, tweezers, and ethanol samples. So hopefully we can get some hairs and that can lead to DNA analysis. I love tracking um, these, these, these animals, yeah, especially as I'm firmly convinced that one's around this area. It's a massive rush. Yeah, so if we, if we see something, you know, it's going to be wild. Oh, I know, a footprint. Davies is working with the most experienced yeah. guide in the region, a local by the name of Sahar. We've found our first animal print of the day. Um, which is obviously good news because um, it means the ground isn't so wet and we can get prints. This one here, this small print, is an Asian golden cat. Just a few hundred yards from camp, Davies makes an even more ominous discovery. evidence that another animal is in the area, a potentially dangerous predator. What Sahar's saying is this, um, this is the bones of a deer that's been killed by a tiger around here. Just a few hundred yards from the base camp, Adam Davies has found several carcasses and signs that this is a fresh feeding site for a tiger. At over seven feet long and up to 300 pounds, the Sumatran tiger is the top predator here. It feeds on deer, boar, and even primates like orangutans and occasionally humans. I'm no anatomist, but my initial um, uneducated view about these things is it would fit quite neatly in there. <laughs> so there we go, pig. It's not, a, it obviously wasn't a, uh, 
an orangutan deck, we're not going to be that lucky. <laughs> Davies estimates the carcass is only days old. The bones rot a lot in the jungle, yeah? Can you see the fungus on the, on the tip of it already? Yeah. Finding an orang pendak carcass would be a rare find indeed. As these bones show, it takes the jungle little time to break down remains. Just past the trail from the pig and deer bones are signs of more animals. Deer. A bear. Yeah, this is a bear. Claiming it's for you. She's close. Where has he climbed up there? Yeah. Think he might be up there now? <laughs> no. <laughs> Skeptics say the moon jab or sun bear is one likely animal that people could mistake for the orang pendek. At only four feet tall, it is the smallest bear species. It can walk briefly on its hind legs and is an excellent climber. So here we've just found some claw marks from Malay sun bear. This is probably the, the biggest culprit in confusion with orang pendek. Similar kind of size, similar kind of habits but probably the, the most damning thing is that the, the footprint that a bear leaves looks much more like a small human footprint than that left by Oren Pendek. The true identity of the Orang Pendek has long been a mystery. When Venetian explorer Marco Polo was visiting the island of Sumatra in 1295, islanders allegedly presented him with a small ape-like man. They had seen exactly the same thing. The local people were reporting this erect bipedal ape gliding in and out of the forest. They come out of the edge of the forest into plantations, and that's where they've been seen most by people at dawn and dusk. Jeremy Holden also claims to have seen the Orang Pendek and says that it is not a sun bear or any other known animal. The first thing I thought was it, was it was much bigger than I'd expected. At a lower elevation near the park's entrance, Jeremy Holden first noticed the unusual footprint in a potato field. I called my guide over and said, you know, what's this? And he immediately said, this is our appendix. Holden followed the trail into the forest. And as I made my way in, I saw a banana palm sway like this. So I just ducked down. And then, no more than seven meters away, I saw the animal pass in front of me. So it was, it was very close. I had a camera around my neck, I was very close to it, but I just kept quiet and watched it just briefly pass. Although he never saw the face, Holden did get a good profile view of the creature. I saw the side of the head and the, the huge arms which were moving like a human when that walks and down to the waist. But something that's very erect, it wasn't stooped over, it wasn't shuffling or stumbling like I've seen orangutans do when they're on the ground. This was something that was clearly at home, walking on two legs. With this, it was a, a clear pelt of what appeared to be quite short hair. And the, the color of the animal I saw was like a yellowish, almost like dried grass. Even now, the sighting haunts Holden. With a camera around his neck, he never took a photo. Seeing Oren Pendek was probably the, the greatest achievement, the greatest uh, victory in my whole life. Not photographing it is certainly it, is my greatest failure. Davies shares Holden's frustration. When you know something's there, you know something's tangible. Um, I just want to do my best to try and prove it. Adam Davies is now near the same spot where he found his best track in 2001. The heavy rain has washed these trails clean of any animal sign. They have found nothing, but that is about to change. Oh, wait. What's this? What? Print. Oh, yeah. What do you make of that? Have a look. No, oh, I think it's a... Uh... Orang Pendek footprint. Orang Pendek footprint, brilliant. Yeah, I think so. Why? Ah, oh, oh, I see yeah. the shape, yeah. You can see the opposable thumb, yeah? I think so. It's the same size as the prints that we found last yeah. time near here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Fantastic, well done. At about six inches in diameter, 
with short toes and an opposable thumb, the print appears to be similar to the track he found here in 2001. Well, what I want you to do, right, what I want you to do <coughs> is if you go up, go up the trail, yeah, mm -hmm. and have a look to see if you can see any more, yeah. OK? Because I don't want to corrupt the ground by two of us walking on it. Mm -hmm. If you see any hairs, okay. don't touch them. Just, just tell me where they are. Yeah. So you go and have a look now, yeah, and I'll stay here. Yeah. If you see anything, we'll come back and discuss them, we'll okay? Come back here again. Yeah, and we'll make a plaster of Paris cast of this one, yeah? Okay, right. In a bit. Forest guide, Adam. Forest guide, cheers, mate. Yeah, Adam, uh, forest guide. Adam, forest guide. <laughs> one good print could be enough to prove this is the same animal from 2001. Additional prints could reveal a resident population. Adam, come here. What have you got, Saha? You can see uh, one more footprint. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. It is. Around the deck? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Hold on. It's the same size as the other one. Yeah. Yeah. See. So the animals come through here on a trail. Oh, that's brilliant. I've got another one. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. That's really good work, Sahar. I can't believe it. This is in the same place, it's the same shape as the ones we found last time. In all, they find four distinct prints spread out over 200 yards before the trail goes cold. But there is another important clue here, one that leads Davies to conclude this animal is walking on two legs. creature has come down here walking bipedally in other words on two legs and because this section is difficult you've got the tree trunk there it's put its hand there for grip and this moss here has come off it so sheared off it like that as it's gone through these sort of clues are really important a to determine what type of creature it is and b to actually picking up its trail the damp conditions make the casts fragile, and Davies nervous. It's almost, in these sort of situations for me, because I can feel the adrenaline pumping, it's almost like waiting for somebody to give birth, because I've had prints before, and they've crumbled away. Oh, yeah, that's a really good one. And you can see the toes and the opposable thumb. Um, so we need to get it cleaned up back in camp. But at least we've got one print that's working. I'm really, really pleased. Oh, it's in one piece. Oh, yeah. And you can, yeah. You can see. Again, you can see the print, can't you? And the toes on it. Fantastic. Three in a row. That's awesome. But before they can cast the final print, the sky opens up again. Yes, Cover this one over, and we'll go back to camp and we'll leave this one for Jeremy to have a look at. Fresh tracks mean something is in the area, and they want to lure it back within range of the camera traps. Davies brought pheromone chips made from ape sexual secretions. I kind of think that this is an unknown species, so nothing ventured, nothing gained but it's been chemically composed, apparently, to attract um, primates. Oh. <laughs> I, hope, I hope the around pendant likes her men smelling strong. With the casts firm enough to transport, they head back to camp to share the find with the rest of the team. Jeremy, Jeremy, we've got some prints. Do uh, get them out and show you. Okay, I think we need to uh, give these a clean now so that we can properly see the definition on them.
In the remote jungle of Sumatra, an island of Indonesia, Monster Quest researchers Jeremy Holden and Adam Davies are hot on the trail of what they believe is an Orang Pendek, or OP, as they call it. I am a field researcher, I am not a scientist, but I understand the importance of getting anything credibly and independently analyzed. This is where um, I found the first print here. We've got um, at least four good ones, and it's the last one I especially want to show you. because that's... With the wet weather, it could take days before the casts are dry enough to examine. So Adam brings Jeremy back to the location where it was found to search for other evidence, like hair or droppings. OK, mate, it's right up here. Clearly got the four, like, oh, maybe one toe obscured by this, that root. Yep. Clearly four toes, and I guess this is, corresponds to the hallux or the thumb. What do you think, Jeremy? It's certainly not tiger, it's not tapir. And it's with the spacing here and this toe down here, it's, it's certainly not bear either, which gives us really not much choice. And it seems to be a print of a large primate. Unfortunately, just as we put the plaster into the print, it started to pour with rain. So we've covered it up. It's now a day and a half later because the rain just didn't stop at all yesterday. I don't know what state this is going to be in, whether it's going to be usable or not. We just have to hope. Oh. Not sure that's going to convince any skeptics. <laughs> With the pheromone chips in place, they want to position another camera trap directly over this location. So we're going to put a camera here, because this is where Adam found the first footprints and also where he's left the pheromones. So there's perhaps some likelihood the animal's going to come back this way, check those out. So if it does, we need to have a camera here to catch that. With all the camera traps set, they return to camp to clean up and examine the prints. That's just over 16 centimeters, which is about six inches. The prints we found over the other side of the mountain were all usually about 21 centimeters. But the prints I found last time were about 16. Comparable evidence is important. If these new prints are a match to the mystery prints Davies found in 2001, then they believe a case can be made that this is the same animal or animal species. The, the shortness of it could well be because these toes almost seem to be pointing. I mean, look at the depth of this, for instance. Yeah. And here also, it seems almost the toes are digging. Was this found on a slope? Yes, it was. Anything with a 16 centimeter foot, you've got that's usually about the size of a bear's footprint. Mm. They use about 16 centimetres. For a tiger, that's big. Mm. It's also about the, the, the same size as a tapir. With a tapir, obviously, mm. you've got one big toe, two, mm. two toes coming yeah. out the side here. A tiger, four big pads. A bear, the toes are very, very close together. And it's more like a, sm actually like a small human foot. Mm. But here, with this obvious hallux, this can only be a primate, yeah. something with an opposable thumb. The only non-human primate large enough to make this print is the Sumatran orangutan, which has never been seen in this area. Furthermore, while both have an opposable thumb, the length of the toes are no match. And as there are no large terrestrial primates known from Kerinci Sablak National Park, it's an unknown species of, of terrestrial primate, and probably Orempendek, the animal we're looking for. Fantastic. The team packs up the casts to be sent on to Dr. Jeff Meldrum, professor of anatomy and anthropology at Idaho State University. Well, this is interesting. Meldrum is an expert on mystery ape footprints. He houses one of the largest collections of Bigfoot, Yeti, and other mystery ape footprints in the world. So footprint casts have, have continued to accumulate here in my lab. 
Not only does Meldrum have Davy's new casts, but a copy of the mystery print from Davy's expedition in 2001. Adam's original print from several years ago uh, has some interesting comparisons and contrasts to the new ones. I mean, if, if this is perhaps a divergent big toe, then we would we see that it's, it's disposed much further up the foot than is suggested here. Of the four prints cast by Davies and Holden, two appear to have enough detail for further examination. We, we actually have Adam's original print already scanned into our virtual museum, our virtual collection. So I'd like to take these over to the uh, Idaho Virtualization Lab and have these two scanned and get some 3D renderings. For more than a century, stories of a small human-like creature have drifted out of Indonesia, with the island of Sumatra at the epicenter, a creature that some say is very similar to skeletal remains found in neighboring Flores, a miniature man dubbed the Real Hobbit. This woman says that a sighting changed her life. It was like seeing something from the wrong side of time. Locals claim it walks on two feet and has a human-looking face. This man cast a print in 2001 that experts say is unlike any primate known to man. And Monster Quest launched an expedition in an effort to uncover the mystery. We've got um, at least four good ones. Jeremy Holden and Adam Davies have found four footprints that they believe belong to a mystery ape most call the Orang Pendek. Right What's been special is we've got an animal actually following a trail continually, which we, and we've actually been able to mark it off for some distance. They have been in the forest now for seven days with camera traps snapping away. It is time to leave, and he is hoping at least one camera has captured what they seek. Yeah, there's always a great sense of anticipation when it, whenever you collect film. Whenever I was collecting films from here, for instance, you always think this could be the time. The first camera trap reveals there are photos. Because of the high humidity, especially this week where it's rained every single day, the cameras still worked. We, all we caught was pictures of Adam and Sahar coming back from, from one of their treks. But it still shows that the, the cam cameras are working. And that's an that's important thing. As they check each trap, the story is the same. Any, any pictures of us again? Only one camera trap remains to be checked, but it is also the most anticipated. So this is the last camera trap. Set where the pheromones were placed and also where we found the first prints. So it's the one most likely to have anything. No, nothing. Once again, a photograph of the Orang Pendek has eluded both men. Well, disappointed, yeah, but not surprised. It will still be several days before they can make it out of the jungle and contact Dr. Meldrum, but nothing can overshadow their excitement about the possible results of the footprint analysis. Robert, here are those uh, casts from Sumatra that we were anticipating. We'd like to get uh, a three-dimensional scan of. And it is. The prints are scanned using two lasers of different size and speed. The resulting images are not only in 3D, but minute details mostly invisible to the naked eye are now revealed. It allows us to analyze these structures uh, quantitatively in three dimensions. We can make very precise measurements, very precise comparisons between specimens. The three-dimensional images offer us ways not only to visualize, but also to analyze the specimen in ways that uh, simple photography or even uh, holding the original specimen in hand uh, don't afford. 
what we will be looking for are characteristic features that would distinguish a possible hominoid, an ape or some sort of primate, from um, another human or um, from uh, other common forms of uh, wildlife that might have a track that could be mistaken for presumed orang pendek. Once the images are scanned, Meldrum moves in for a closer look. Actually, can you tip it just a hair more this way? Well, this is interesting. Now, uh, things are, are a little more apparent to me than they were previously. Meldrum is optimistic. Four fresh prints and older prints for comparison likely mean answers. They have a prominent pad right here that will sometimes uh, register in the track. And then we have uh, the four outer toes. But a closer look tells him a much different story. And what I was trying to uh, infer as a, as a hallux is actually the ulnar pad uh, of a bear. It appears to be the forepaw of a bear. The evidence seems to point pretty conclusively that, uh, that this is a bear track. I think you'd have, be hard pressed to make a case for this being the, the track of a, a plantigrade primate. And when compared to the older mystery aprons, he finds they are not a match. There's a certain degree of disappointment that, that we didn't have the definitive footprint evidence for an unrecognized primate. Despite the results of their expedition, Davies and Holden have not lost faith in their belief that the Orang Pendek is real and will someday be found. But there comes a point when you say, look, there's been so much evidence here. We've really got to do something about this before this area is gone. And if there is a, um, a, a primate here, as appears to be the case, then it's time to sort of sit up and take notice and put some money here and have a go. Because if, when it's gone, it's gone forever. And now's the time to take some action. They are the stuff of nightmares. I've often asked myself why Wisconsin should sort of be the epicenter for these sightings. History does not support the possibility that werewolf-like creatures exist. You can't rely on confessions of being a werewolf when somebody's under torture. But in America's heartland, people are seeing something. It had big teeth that hung down. It was like, like a dog's howl. Science explores the probability with a modern-day quest for answers. And for the first time, eyewitnesses are put to the test. Are you lying about seeing those upright hairy creatures by that creek? No. Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers on Monster Quest. Picturesque Wisconsin, the landscape dotted with dairy farms, quaint villages, clear streams and vast forests, filled with wildlife. There have also been over 200 eyewitness reports describing something that should not be here. This thing was big, anywhere from six foot seven to probably seven two. The shape of his head was canine. This thing had jumped a 12 foot leap. Hair was everywhere around, I mean, it was big. 600 pounds, 700, I don't know, but it was huge. Eyewitness accounts describe the creature at least three very different ways. Wolf-like, bear-like, or more like a Bigfoot. Height ranges between six and eight feet, and the creature has human-like hands and feet. In Wisconsin, the beast is commonly referred to as the Dogman. One train of thought is that these are all Bigfoot sightings. Another is that they are known animals, misidentified. This investigation concentrates on the theory that they are wolf-like creatures, which while implausible, are not new to history. From about 1450 to 1700, hundreds of people were tried and executed in the great witch and werewolf trials of medieval Europe. While most were innocent people caught up in the hysteria, one man did confess. Peter Stubb believed that he was a wolf. There is no doubt about that. Peter Stubb of Bedburg, Germany, described himself as an insatiable bloodsucker under torture, he confessed to killing and eating 14 children, two pregnant women, and the pregnant women's fetuses. 
Stubb said the devil gave him a belt that allowed him to turn into a greedy, devouring wolf. When he put on the belt, he obviously thought that he had the strength to perform all those strange acts which he confessed. The magic belt was never found, and Stubb was ultimately executed based on his convincing confession. Some people who were accused of being werewolves might actually have suffered from a disease called St. Anthony's fire. It's caused by a fungus that grows on rye, which happened to be a staple food of the peasantry of the time. The technical term is ergot. And ergot, or St. Anthony's fire, causes all kinds of delusions, strange behavior, and uh, can be fatal. And it was very widespread in those days. Psychiatrist and wildlife biologist, Dr. Greg Bambinek believes there is a simpler explanation. There was a psychiatrist in the late 1600s, happened to be a, a friend of the King of France, said, wait a minute, these are mental disorders. You can't rely on confessions of being a werewolf when somebody's under torture. And that started both the werewolves and witches being realized to be a mental disorder and not some wild creature. Lycanthropy, the belief that one is a werewolf is now a recognized psychosis. Since the 1960s and the advent of antipsychotic drugs, it has all but disappeared. Wolf-like creatures now live in the realm of psychology and Wisconsin. We went out on a Friday night to a fish fry, actually. It was a clear night. There's a bridge that we have to go across, and you have to make a left-hand turn right after the bridge. And I spotted something on the bridge in my headlights. I stopped approximately 20, 25 feet from the creature. I think I may have said to him, my God, what is that? Had his back to us at first and swung around and looked right in the car. I made eye contact with it. 600 pounds, 700, I don't know, but it was huge, over seven foot tall. As far as the fur, it was reddish brown. The eyes were black. It didn't just vanish into nowhere, it jumped off of a bridge. It's like, I can't believe you saw that, you know, what was that? Did we really see that thing, you know, even? Did you see that? The witnesses that um, have talked to me seem very genuine in their stories. Linda Godfrey is a journalist and researcher who has investigated over 100 eyewitness accounts in Wisconsin, compiling them into a book called The Beast of Bray Road, an area where many sightings occurred. The witness group entails everybody from children to the very elderly, men, women, white collar, blue collar, I really believe that all of these witnesses have seen what they said they saw. Dr. Greg Bambinek and hunting guide Don Young have traveled to Wisconsin in a monster quest search for evidence of the dogman. Most of the area in there is swamp surrounded and enclosed with highland. And like the Paglieronis, Young too claims to have seen the beast. Since 2002, I've seen this thing five times. My last sighting was last year. Uh, last year alone, I had three sightings. In total, I've had five. Young is a veteran hunter and guide. The thing that I seen was at least six, six and a half, seven feet tall. The hair that it had was a, a brownish black. It had uh, human looking feet, eyes black. Bambinek believes most eyewitnesses are simply misidentifying a known animal like a bear or a wolf, but he is willing to investigate. Oh, one last thing, Dad, I need DNA kit. Masks so we don't give them any illnesses. They're called vacutainers. They ask we don't have any blood on us. Well, what's that for there? Vacutainer. What is that uh, stuff on the bottom of it? That preserves it so you don't need to refrigerate it. Please. 
set this around. Well, this is a chronograph. We're trying to get a low enough speed. Okay. So we're not gonna harm him. Whatever is out there, Bambinek wants a live body to either prove his misidentification theory or validate Young's unknown beast assertions. Well, this is the dart we use, the 7cc dart. Together, they plan to walk the same game trails where Young had his most recent encounter. Yep, right on. Hoping to elicit a similar encounter, an area Young would like to keep secret to protect whatever is really out there. Direct hit, bullseye. Whatever or whoever is behind the sightings, Bambinek does not want to kill it. And now it's ready, all it needs is a cap on there. Tranquilizer gun, we're able to gather DNA evidence, get some blood samples, uh, do some chemistries on them as well as, as DNA, uh, get some hair samples, close-up photographs. The area is near the location of another sighting one that suggests Wisconsin may have real dog men. Well, you lead the way. It was a lazy summer day. Katie Zahn and two friends were out driving around. We happened to come across a bridge that was near State Park. A park where others claimed to have seen the beast, so they thought it was worth a look. The closer we got to the water, we noticed that there were some creatures just kneeling down, drinking some water. We noticed that they weren't humans, but they acted like humans, drinking water like a human would. They stood up and to started to walk towards us. Let's get out of here. We're just trying to get out of there as quick as we could. Katie Zahn, like other witnesses Linda Godfrey has interviewed, has never been subjected to scientific scrutiny. Until now. Zahn has agreed to undergo a polygraph examination. I think it'll prove a lot more than just what we have told. You know, I think it'll just kind of verify everything that has happened. A polygraph, commonly but incorrectly referred to as a lie detector, is a device that measures and records several physiological variables, such as blood pressure, pulse, respiration, and skin conductivity, while the subject is asked a series of questions. The measurements are supposed to be indicators of anxiety that accompany the telling of lies. Some experts believe it is accurate in 70 to 90 percent of the cases. Sergeant William Mackey works for the Grand Forks, North Dakota Police Department and is an expert in administering polygraph tests. I'll be looking for changes in your pulse, changes in your blood volume, and changes in your relative pressure. We'll be placing one of these clips on your index finger, one on your ring finger. These are going to record changes in your sweat gland activity. Before this year, did you ever consider lying to avoid embarrassment? No. It would be logical to dismiss the sightings as a hoax or exaggeration. Are you lying about seeing those upright hairy creatures by that creek? No. But how do you explain her account if she passes? Something is said to be lurking in the Wisconsin wilderness, and Katie Zahn claims to have seen it. Let's get out of here. The legend of the so-called dogman is similar in some ways to Native American lore. I believe that, that, that we're talking about a shapeshifter. Shapeshifting is a common theme in mythology and folklore. It is a physical change or transformation in the shape or form of a person or animal. David walks his bear as a game warden with the Shawnee Nation. He says while the beast of Native American lore can shapeshift, its behavior is very different. And a shapeshifter, um, at least in the American Indian culture, and American Indian culture is generic from one nation to the next, is more of a trickster than, um, than what you always associate with, uh, with, say, the European werewolves or, you know, what we've always seen on TV of the wolf man, those kinds of things. Um, a trickster is just exactly that. I've never come across um, an upright wolf man, dog man, 
that doesn't mean that um that I preclude these from being real. In European tradition, creatures like this are bloodthirsty, and there is one account that stands out. In south central France from 1764 to 1767, an unknown entity killed upwards of 80 men, women, and children. The so-called Beast of Gavaudan was described as a giant wolf by the sole survivor of the attacks, which ceased after wolves were hunted down and killed in the area. One modern theory is that the murders were committed by an early serial killer or killers. Another theory was that it was a pack of hungry wolves, yet people at the time called it a werewolf. They, like many Americans, may have been influenced by another folk legend dating back to the 13th century, the legend of the Woodhouse, or wild man of the woods. Uh, we know what they looked like, especially because we know them from, uh, from the figures in English churches in both Suffolk and Norfolk. The carvings generally feature a giant hair-covered man, often carrying a club. They're usually described in a traditional way in which you would expect anyone living in a forest should be described. That is a long beard. Sometimes they're depicted as naked, but with so much hair uh, that the hair covers the entire body. The Woodhouse was often considered neither man nor beast. It was said to be protective of humans it liked and ruthless with those it did not. But modern theorists believe the Woodhouse may have been feral or a wild human raised by animals. Prior to your last birthday, did you ever think about lying to gain attention? No. Katie Zahn is one eyewitness that has agreed to a polygraph test. Prior to this year, did you ever deliberately lie to somebody who trusted you? No. Are you lying about seeing those upright hairy creatures by that creek? No. The results are revealing. The conclusion on Katie Zahn's polygraph was no deception indicated. It's my opinion that she was being truthful about seeing three uh, animals walking on their hind legs uh, down at the base of that bridge by the creek. The polygraph corroborates her story to a point. However, it does not rule out misidentification. Mm -hmm. Like Zahn, hunting guide Don Young has had encounters with a beast. One was in the summer of 2006 while hunting in southern Wisconsin. Well, it was uh, hunting season, gun deer season. And like usual, I walk through the woods next to my house to get to this little road called Mount Bailey Road. And look down, seeing something hunched over. Thought it was maybe a black bear because it had uh, brownish, brownish black colorations to it. The thing that I seen was at least six and a half, seven feet tall, extremely bulky. Arms were extremely heavily built, low hung, had uh, human looking feet. This thing had jumped a 12 foot leap with only two to three steps. Well, the main reason I didn't shoot at this thing was one, it wasn't bear season, it was deer season. So if it was a bear, I would have been a poacher if I would have shot it because I didn't have no bear license in the, in the first place. Two, if it was what I had suspected at the time as being a guy in a monkey suit, well, then it would have been murder. Head to a spruce swamp. That should be a good area in there. Spruce swamp. No, you lead the way. Bambanek and Young are now in their second day, crisscrossing well-worn game trails. Yeah. Be a good passage area over there, bottleneck. The most logical explanation for Zahn and Young's account is misidentification, since the woods of Wisconsin are teeming with wildlife. But Godfrey believes that doesn't explain the sightings. 
anybody who drives around much in Wisconsin has seen so many deer and so many bear and these other creatures that um, they would have a very hard time mistaking something like that for a completely unknown animal. Dr. Bambinek says many eyewitness accounts suggest it's a black bear or timber wolf temporarily standing on its hind legs to peer over an object like a tree trunk or tall grass. But if Young's account of a creature jumping a ditch on its hind legs is to be believed, there is a problem. One of the reasons I don't think people are seeing bears is there's a very different image out in the forest. I mean, they can get up on, on two feet if they want to grab something up in a tree, and but if they walk on two feet, they do it for a short period of time, but it's a very clumsy, lumbering type of walk. Not the kind that's seen with these creatures. Also, they have sloping shoulders, their legs are much shorter, and they just are, would go down on all fours. If not a bear, then what? Hard evidence is lacking. It's really stuck together. Linda Godfrey collects more than just stories. In 2005, Godfrey received a hair sample from an anonymous woman who claimed an unknown beast was on her roof. When it jumped, a piece of fur was torn off on the metal roofing. This is a piece of some kind of fur that was identified by a wildlife biologist as uh, possibly some kind of canid fur. He didn't know what kind. Godfrey sent the hair sample to Dr. Lynn Rogers, a wildlife biologist in Ely, Minnesota, who knows every creature that lurks there. Oh, this one puzzled me at first because it didn't match any of the things I thought it might be. Skunk, mink, bear, coyote, uh, but it wasn't any of those, it wasn't any North American native animal that I'm used to looking at. By comparing attributes such as thickness, ring patterns, and other characteristics, experts can often pinpoint the exact species that a hair specimen is derived from. DNA analysis can be reserved for the most puzzling cases, but in this case, DNA will not be needed. This was nothing other than just plain old domestic cat. Hunter Don Young says he knows what he saw, and it's no cat. I had a ground blind that was on a hill. At the bottom of the hill, I noticed the back, buttocks, and leg of an upright animal, like, for, well, it was covered with hair. So I hear a growl. It's like, oh, oh. Then there's this maple tree that was out there. Started whipping back and forth, but it was so violently whipping it back and forth that the leaves had all come off of this tree. Well, I got out of there. Babinek and Young Search is about to turn something up. Don and I went out to a place where he had a sighting. We were going along a ridge, and a pileated woodpecker just started going crazy. He was doing an alarm call. But this went on for five minutes, and both of us thought, this is pretty unusual. Usually they stop and fly away, but it had not seen us. Walked a little bit, saw the pileated woodpecker, and it saw us, and it was looking the other way. Returned, saw us, and flew away. Don started walking, and I thought, well, why don't we check out what it was doing? It was down in this swamp. Whoa. Maybe that's a huge bed. Really huge. The Midwest has a long history of an unknown upright walking beast, referred to as the dog man. There has been a spike in the number of sightings in the last two decades, like that of John Lyons in the summer of 2006. Well, we came out here probably about 1.30 in the morning, past the schoolhouse, and we went and turned around farther down the road. We sat there for, I guess, it's 30, 35, 45 minutes. 
We start hearing noises in front of us, behind us, and over to our, our left. It wasn't a deer, you know, it wasn't a bear, it wasn't pretty much anything else. We think that was the dog man. Most eyewitness accounts, like Lyons, lack supporting evidence. However, Bambinek and Young have found something. I don't believe it's in this sawgrass. Look, something's been eating it. Nothing eats that stuff. It was nine feet long and six feet wide and had a trail coming in both ends. Center of that bed, all the sawgrass had been eaten right down to the ground almost. What could be eating that? Not even a goat will eat that stuff. Cut its mouth all to pieces. Because of the sharp saw-like serrations on the blades, dense beds of sawgrass can be dangerous to navigate through as the blades easily cut flesh. Consequently, Sawgrass beds in Wisconsin generally do not harbor animals of any size. But there are more impressions made by something large and heavy. And inside of it were footprints in the sawgrass, and they were like 18 inches long. Step there from there, that's, that's at least four feet. There appears to be what I believe are biped footprints, especially on the trail coming in. You can see where it stepped over the sawgrass. We do have a lot of wildlife in the area, deer and bear, but uh, deer aren't going to make a bed like this. They're going to have scattered you know, two, three feet apart. This is, this is either something very big or something clustered together. With daylight fading and an impending storm approaching, they find one more piece of possible evidence, a strand of hair. This tangible clue will be examined in the lab when they return. It was a beautiful day like today in the fall. Instead of taking the freeway through Elkhorn and go home, I got off on Highway 11 just for the ride. Marv Kirschnick is a Wisconsin artist. As I approached this one farm area, I saw something standing uh, behind a fallen tree. I looked out through the window and I saw an object standing behind this fallen tree. And I thought at first it was uh, like a large dog, but the size was just too great for it to be a dog. And as I'm looking, I noticed that this creature noticed me and he was kind of moving and rummaging a little bit. He stopped and he looked at me and we made eye contact and we just looked at each other. <laughs> I looked around, there's nothing, so I just drove off. Kirschnick not only drew a rough sketch of the creature he saw, but has also filled his home with intricate sculptures and artworks based on his encounter. This is one of my pieces that I created to eliminate any doubt or fears that I had about this creature. I made the creature, I put myself into him so that I would be more relaxed with uh, what I saw. Kirschnick's rendering looks canine with one big exception, the human-like hands. Kirschnick has also agreed to take a polygraph test. There's nothing that anyone can say to change my mind. There's nothing that anyone can do to make me not believe that this creature is real. Oh, I'd take any test. Okay, if you want to lean forward and put your arms straight out, okay. Polygraph expert Sergeant William Mackey, a member of the American Polygraph Association, conducted Kirschnick's test in strict accordance with that organization's rules. Regarding your statement about seeing that creature, do you intend to answer each question truthfully? Yes. 
Whether Kirschnick will show evidence of deception remains to be seen. Are you lying about seeing an upright hairy creature standing by that fallen tree? No. But not every eyewitness account is a good candidate for polygraph testing. We heard yelling and screaming from the front. So my mother and I walked to the front yard to see what was going on. In 1977, Milwaukee eyewitness Kim Del Rio was only seven years old when she claimed to see the beast. We saw, as well did several neighbors, the woman across the street clutching her child to her, about a four-year-old kid, like this close and yelling, help, go away, go away. And what she was yelling at was this unusual animal going across her front lawn. To this day, my mother simply refers to it as that dog thing. All you have to do is just close your eyes and take a few comfortably deep breaths. Time can fade or change memories, especially those of children affecting the quality of a polygraph test. However, hypnosis may reveal hidden memories. Del Rio agreed to be hypnotized by Milwaukee area hypnotist Jerry Calvi to help bring back a more conclusive memory of the event. And this thing's walking across her lawn and she's yelling at it to go away. It was 1977, and Kim Del Rio was just seven years old when she claims to have encountered a man beast. I think one of the connections as a child that I made to having it seem like a baboon was the fact that it had fingers. Because of Del Rio's young age at the time of the sightings, she is not a good polygraph candidate but hypnosis may shed light on her account. My goal in working with this young lady was to use hypnosis to regress her back to a time of her life where she could accurately re-experience or at least uh, very clearly remember details that usually aren't easily remembered in a conscious state. All you have to do is just close your eyes and take a few comfortably deep breaths. As you listen to my voice, your body will be relaxing, completely relaxing. First, we'll relax the body to a great deal, and then through some other methods, continue to relax the thought process so that they're easy to focus on just one thought or one subject or one area at a time. Each number down is a step down into a deeper, more peaceful, pleasant place within you. Hypnotherapist Jerry Calvi is using a technique called regressive hypnosis. It's meaner than I remembered it. The hair on his body is short, but it's longer on his tail. Longer on his tail. And it's got big hands and big teeth, and, and it's hunched over, and it's twitchy and looking around. It's very difficult to tell whether somebody has a vivid imagination and is just relaying to you some things out of their imagination or they are actual events. But as close as we could tell, um, she believed exactly what she was saying. These did not seem like imaginary events to her, neither before nor after. So it's as accurate a representation, I think, as we can get. I noticed details that I didn't recall, the, the size of the hands, um, the, the bushiness of the fur across the back of the shoulders, um, how nervous and twitchy, kind of scared that the animal was. I didn't remember any of that at all, but under hypnosis, I, I remembered it quite clearly. It's possible that Del Rio was influenced by a strange story passed from generation to generation. The small town of Primrose was said to be overrun with wolves in the mid-1800. But these were not your ordinary wolves. They would run alongside settlers' sleighs in the snow and then suddenly vanish in a puff of mist or smoke so that the settlers decided they were being beset by werewolves. And this was considered a very ill omen indeed if they saw one of these disappearing wolves. At the time, Wisconsin was flush with newly arriving German immigrants. There were many things that attracted people from the Germanic-speaking states of Europe 
to the Midwest in the 1800s. Um, Europe at that time was full of unrest and they came seeking similar land, a similar climate. Germany, like Wisconsin, was home to wolves. This led to a lot of confrontations between wolves and humans and therefore to many superstitions about wolves growing up in the human communities. The superstition traveled to Wisconsin with those German immigrants and today that tradition combined with a very real comeback story could help explain the strange sightings. By 1960, known gray wolf breeding pairs had officially been eradicated in Wisconsin. Since that time, the wolf population has rebounded to about 500 animals, largely due to protection under the Endangered Species Act put in place in 1974. Since their reappearance, the number of dog man sightings has also increased. In 1989, Dennis Hastings was coon hunting with a buddy near Kenosha, Wisconsin. And we were about 20 yards away from the patch of woods that we had walked out of. And at that point, we turned the dog loose and let it go hit another track. You heard it? Yeah. What the heck? What the heck was that? I don't know. The dog's heading off that way now. And all of a sudden, we start hearing something walking about 20 yards out into the woods. Oh, man! It's loud. It might be a buck and rut, Dennis. And as soon as he said that, the thing went... <laughs> Holy cow, that was no buck and rut. I don't know what the heck that is, but I'm loading a gun. I said to my hunting partner, I think it's gone. And right after I said, I think it's gone, we heard... <laughs> that thing just jumped out of the tree. Although Hastings never saw the beast up close, he claims it was man-sized and walked on two legs. Even more recently, in 2003, Wisconsin resident Matt Wakeley claims to have had an encounter with a similar animal. It was about 2, 2.30ish in the afternoon on a clear sunny day and the sun was shining through the trees in the cemetery. Just as I turned the corner, I had looked into the cemetery and through the trees, I could see a figure standing there. The creature had to be about um, at least six feet tall because it was standing on a stone. It had its foot up on a stone. It just really watched me, which was kind of creepy. Hair was everywhere around. I mean, it was big, like, I would describe it as 80s hair. It had a real um, pronounced brow, like a Cro-Magnon type brow. A real wide nose and a mouth that kind of came out almost like an ape. I don't feel it really wanted to hurt me. I really didn't want to stay to find out if it was going to. Um, I didn't want to stop the car to, to see if it would, you know, charge out or run away or what it would do. The sheer number of sightings point to something strange in these Midwest woods. But are they all telling the truth? Like Katie Zahn and Marv Krishnick, Matt Wakeley has also agreed to a polygraph test. Katie Zahn's polygraph came back as truthful or no deception indicated. But were her results just an aberration? Are you lying about seeing a hairy caveman-like creature in that cemetery? No. Eyewitnesses in Wisconsin describe a creature that does not exist, at least in the scientific world. Researcher Linda Godfrey has recorded the testimony of hundreds of eyewitnesses. This man says it stared him down as he drove by. And this woman was only seven when she saw the dog man. These two said the creature jumped off a bridge in front of them. This man has been filling his life with images to help him cope. And this man says he has seen the beast five different times.
In addition to Katie Zahn, four contemporary witnesses have agreed to undergo polygraph tests. Regarding your statement about seeing that creature, do you intend to answer each question truthfully? Yes. Are you lying about seeing a hairy caveman-like creature in that cemetery? No. Wisconsin residents Marv Kirschnick, Matt Wakely, and husband and wife Mary and David Pagliaroni have all been laughed at and ridiculed for their stories. And now for the moment of truth. Now is their chance to prove they are not making it up. All were very animated in the way they communicated with me. All of them um, described their sightings. They used uh, nonverbal uh, communication to describe their sightings. Uh, it was as if they were trying to walk me through what they had seen. Pass or fail, it, it doesn't make any difference to me. Uh, I know what I saw. The polygraph conclusion for Marv Kirschnick's polygraph was no deception indicated to the uh, relevant topic. Uh, the relevant topic in this case being whether or not he actually saw uh, an animal that resembled a dog standing on its hind legs, uh, standing uh, behind that fallen tree on Highway 11. I think the test went great. I didn't have anything to hide or lie about, and I feel it's going to show that what I saw is what I saw. Matt Wakely, the results for his polygraph examination were no deception indicated to the relevant issue. Uh, the relevant issue being whether or not he actually did see a creature in, in the cemetery. I feel the polygraph test went very well. I answered all the questions honestly and to the best of my ability. Uh, I do feel uh, very confident about the, the way the test went. The polygraph results for both David and Mary Pagliaroni were no deception indicated the relevant issue. The relevant issue in this case was, again, whether or not they'd actually observed a large uh, fur-covered animal running on its hind legs. Psychiatrist Greg Bambinek offers one explanation why each witness passed the test. I believe that mass hysteria could have played a big part in the werewolf sightings and sightings of other upright hominid creatures in medieval times. At those times there was a religious fervor and could have explained such incidences. There was the same worldview among many of these people. A state of mind that could have been influenced by centuries of legends like those of the German immigrants or Native Americans and reinforced by modern pop culture. In the Middle Ages, people needed a reason for bad things that were happening, like serial killings, why their cattle were being taken, uh, why children were missing. And so they would come up with reasons for this. Dr. Bambinek and hunting guide Don Young staked out a location where Young claims to have seen the creature regularly over five years. They found a strange sawgrass bed with footprints and a small hair sample. There appears to be what I believe are biped footprints, especially on the trail coming in. You can see where it stepped over the sawgrass and left a hump. Deer will walk straight through, a bear will walk straight through. Something was stepping over it. When I've examined the hairs under a microscope, the ones that we found in, in the eating area where it rolled around in, maybe a red fox, but still it's darker than a red fox. But it is thin like that. All the other hairs, the bear, deer, don't fit with the diameter of the hair. A coyote is just a completely different color. Uh, so red fox is a possibility. Babinek sent the hair sample to forensic examiner Nick Petraco for a more exacting morphology exam. Hmm. This is very interesting. I could see the fact that there's lots of debris on this hair, which would be a good indication to me that it's from an environment that's an, exp an exposed environment like outdoors. Looks like it's from a, an actual living animal. By comparing attributes such as thickness, ring patterns, and other characteristics, experts can often pinpoint the exact species that a hair specimen is derived from. This is a hair from a black bear, so you would expect it to be darker if it's... Uh, medulla is the same, the cuticle margin looks the same, the 
pigmentation looks very similar distribution, only a little darker. All these different morphological features, the thickness, the medulla medullary index, the cortex, the cuticle margin, all this information tell me that this in fact is a, a hair from a brown bear. It's hard to say just what made the ground nest found by Bambinek and Young. While the hair is from a brown colored black bear common to the upper Midwest, the tracks and nest construction do not seem to match bear behavior. After 14 years of research and collecting tales, I'm up to about 100 reported witness sightings between Wisconsin and Michigan alone from normal, credible people. History does not support the possibility that werewolves ever existed or that the Wisconsin dogman is real. Yet scientific polygraphs say eyewitnesses are seeing something they cannot explain away. I just hope someday that I'll finally figure out what really happened out there. But I do believe there are, there are a lot of things out there that we just can't explain that easily. They do exist. I'm 100% sure that these things are real. I'm just not sure exactly what they are. I did not see a dog. I did not see a coyote. I did not see a monkey. I saw something that is entirely unknown. You know, there's something out there that I actually do believe in it more now than I did before because I've actually seen something. The things that go bump in the night, they're there. You just have to accept it. The mystery of the dog man continues to live on in Wisconsin through the many eyewitnesses and their stories much the same way has been passed from generation to generation around the world.